just just an FYI discussion. This is an abnormal distribution. Okay, Barry, we've got uh, pretty much everybody uh, let in the room. Um, so do you want to kick things off? Uh, yeah, I, I noticed we, we have uh, 69. Just, just just wait a minute, just see if there's a few, a few more. Yeah, we're okay. All right, well, I'd like to welcome everyone to the AB Hub, the Australasian Boiler and HRSG Users Group Virtual Conference. My name is Scott Schwieger of Combined Cycle Journal, uh, and I'll be hosting the meeting today. Um, and I would like to first introduce uh, Barry Dooley and Bob Anderson, who will be moderating this three day conference. And we'd certainly like to welcome you all and hope everything uh, is technologically sound, uh, but if you have any problems, please use the chat to chat to me. Um, and that's kind of how we'll communicate with everyone throughout the conference. And there'll be some opportunities for open discussion and Q and A. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Barry. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Scott. And uh, Bob is here as well. And Bob and I would like to uh, to welcome you. Um, we have to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. And it's quite a, a worldwide uh, enter enterprise. This Scott is in is in Brazil. Uh, I'm in the UK. Uh, Bob is in in the US in Florida. And uh, we'd like to welcome you uh, to this uh, second uh, Abhug uh, meeting. Um, and actually. It's the 12th meeting of this type because we'd started um, with uh, a hug without the boiler part, and we added the we added the boiler part a couple of years ago. So this is the uh, actually the 12th uh, meeting. It's the first uh, it's the first virtual meeting. We are uh, very pleased with the um, with the uh, registrations. We have uh, over, well over 100 people. Uh, this time, which is the largest number that we've had at these AHUG, ABHUG meetings. And uh, this represents this year about 45% um, of the total, 45% of the total as users. So that's quite a high, that's quite a high number. So as Scott indicated, we hope that you will enjoy it. We've, um, we have um, 14 presentations spread over the, um, over the three days. And, uh, if Scott can show the next slide, please. Uh, we have um, put this program together with the help of a, a steering committee. Uh, the steering committee I, I mentioned here. Uh, usually at the live meetings, we get uh, these people to stand up, but they're obviously not going to be able to do that. So we'll just thank them. David Addison uh, from uh, New Zealand, Thermal Chemistry in New Zealand. John Blake from Clean Co in Queensland. Rusty Code from HRS, HRL Technology in Victoria, Michael Drew at Ansto, um, Armand Durand at uh, Genesis in New Zealand, Stuart Mann at AGL Victor in Victoria, Keith Newman at with Synergy in Western Australia, and Charles Thomas uh, with Quest Integrity in New Zealand. So thank you, thank you to these people for helping us put the um, put, put in this um, agenda together. And uh, if if you can go, thank you. And we have um, we run Bob and I run these meetings um, in in association and uh, with a number of other organisations. Uh, obviously, um, IAPS, the International Association for the Properties of Water and Steam, but we but we run them in conjunction with two other um, HRSG forums: the HRSG Forum in the US and uh, the European. HRSG forum, which we, uh, when it's live, we hold it in in Europe, and uh, these are held in conjunction with the two um, IAPS organisations, 
uh, 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 AUSAPS, which is the Australian uh, National Committee for IAPS, that's headed by Hayden Henderson, um, and uh, the New Zealand uh, IAPS Organization National Committee, which is led at the moment by uh, David Addison. So thank you for to these. And if we just go to the sponsors, please, uh, Scott. So. We want to say thank you very much to the sponsors. We've taken a lot of time this year to to try to encourage sponsors to take place because usually when the meetings are live, we have very good um, a very good um, uh, set of booths around the um, around the technical presentations. And so we we just want to mention these organisations and thank thank them very much for being uh, sponsors. Uh, Metla Toledo, uh, HRST. Uh, Energy Plan Solutions, Anodamine, Nalco Water, uh, Water Treatment Services, HRL, uh, Duff and Macintosh, and Sentry, um, RTO, and Swan. And each one of these organizations um, will have a 10 minute slot on the agenda. Uh, we'll monitor that very, very carefully. The 10 minutes will be the maximum, but we look forward to hearing what they, uh, what they have to say. The presentations will be uh, 25 minutes, and uh, we, we're going to have to monitor that very carefully because when you have a virtual meeting, people people come in to listen to particular uh, presentations. So, we want to say just uh, finally, uh, thank you to uh, to Mecca uh, Concepts. Um, that they were on the top of the screen here, but they've disappeared. So that's. Uh, that's Heather and Rachel that many of you will have met uh, as you registered, and also uh, Scott who introduced himself with the combined cycle journey. So, Bob, is there anything else that you, you would like to say in introduction? No, you've covered it well. We don't have to give directions to the restroom and all that. So, you know, or, or worry about the fire alarm. So, and no safety. Yeah. Okay. So I think that we can. I think that we can just go straight away into the first um, into the first presentation here by John Blake and Matt Sands, and um, I don't know who's going to take the lead, but but um, please please proceed and introduce yourself. Hi Matt, I've made you the presenter, um, so you can share your presentation. Yeah, if I can, hopefully I get this to work. Oops, what's that? So can you see my presentation now? Yes, it needs uh, you need to put it on full screen uh, mode, Matt, please. I had issues on the trial run with this, so. Content. It's still not working properly. Um, Matt, uh, if you just click on the, if you stop sharing and then click on the button down at the bottom, uh, the share button down at the bottom. Yep. Share that one. Share. So that presentation, it's now full screen on mine, but it's still not showing up on yours. No, not yet. Um, it's the same issue we had on Friday. Was it Thursday? Hey, John, in the background, John, why don't you get up here and help him? 
Uh, Maddie had it right the other day, and then yeah, we took a bit though. <laughs> Could be the, something to do with clean cast configuration too. Let me tell you that. <laughs> I think oh. some hydro stuff coming in here. <laughs> yeah, r r right now, Matt, you're sharing your meeting window, so w we got to get out of that. Yeah, I'm still sharing that again. Share, share, Microsoft PowerPoint. So is that going full screen again? Not yet. Um, is there any way you can just like expand the window? There we there. Yeah, okay. Now we could try full screen. Yeah, that looks good. We'll try that. Yep. Sorry for the uh, technical difficulties, gentlemen and ladies. So, um, yeah, like you did the introduction. Yeah. So, um, as you know, I've attended a few of these, as Barry has said, last dozen or so. And um, but we're we're uh, presenting today on on the challenges we've been experiencing transforming into a, a renewable economy. So, our unit is the GT twenty six um, awesome unit. And of course, with uh, our, our um, local government or the Queensland government has decided to split the generators in Queensland up into three different entities again. And we're part now, we're, we're a renewable arm is what we call it, a renewable arm of, of the Queensland government for, for generation. So there's no coal fires in our portfolio anymore. It's just hydro and, and our unit, Swan Bank, as a, as a combined sulfur unit. But they've uh, actually targeted our unit to actually support renewables, obviously over the peak periods, and that's generally in the afternoon. So we've actually had to um, carry out a number of projects on, on our unit to try and to start daily uh, to meet these market demands. Um, on GE, who, who took over Alstom, obviously they've had different programs. You can have fast start and the like. So. We've implemented a, a lot of different um, technology into the unit to to bring it on quicker, faster ramp rates and the like. But with that comes obviously issues with um, you know thermal transients, thermal transients in boilers, GTs, uh, vibration issues. So I'll hand it over to Maddie and he can walk walk through the slides anyway. But basically that's the background of of what we're um, what we've been challenged with over the last four months, nearly two years now. Thanks, Matt. Yep. So, um, as John mentioned, that we are now um, CleanCo. Um, we've come out of a portfolio that was um, uh, coal fired dominant. Um, so, that was an initiative by the uh, Queensland Government to go to a uh, low carbon emissions renewable economy. Uh, we transitioned to, um, in October 2019. Um, CleanCo now owns uh, 1100 megawatts of low emission energy assets. So, Swan Bank here is a as Blakey said, was a, is a combined cycle gas turbine. We've got the hydros in Korea, Barron, and pump hydro storage at Wyvernhoe. Um, this map on the right-hand side of the slide shows where the assets are located. Um, Clanco is also committed to building the 103 megawatt Corara wind farm and contracted to purchase a further 877 megawatts of renewable energy projects across Queensland in line with the mandate of um, the low emissions um, generator. Um, they're also looking to bring another 460 megawatts of renewable projects in the market by 2025 through building new assets, buying off takes from renewable energy. Um, what does that mean for Swan Bank is we become a firming asset. So our, our role is to support the renewables when the renewables are not renewable. And that, that is driving towards the Queensland's 50% renewable target by 2030. 20, 20, so, a um, bit of um, detail around Swan Bank E. We're a um, GT26 on the um, Alstom design. Uh, maximum efficiency is 58%. Um, we run on 98% methane, um, very good fuel. Very low emissions, so less than 25 parts per million full load, and our CO2 emissions about 350 kilograms per megawatt hour. So, if you want to compare that with a coal fire, we're about one third the emissions for coal fire. So, again, we do fit nicely into the clean code portfolio. 
um, as a low emissions unit and a, dis a dispatchable unit. Um, the unit was commissioned in 2002, um, Q1 summer load following during the day with minimum load overnight. That was our traditional uh, running profile. So we were a base load unit. Um, and then we went into what we call flexible operation mode Q2 to Q4, um, and which is a market driven profile, which I'll touch on very shortly. So market driven operations. Um, since uh, Swan Bank came into the clean crow portfolio, we've gone away from our old running profile of base load. So 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and that was driven mainly because of the low prices during the day where renewables come in and dominate the market. Um, all traditional um, fossil fuel plants are all struggling with that. Um, Swan Bank, again, is, was really struggling with that because of the low prices um, and and we had to become flexible. Um, that has driven a lot of changes, a lot of changes the way we think about the unit. Um, we've had to understand the unit a lot better um, and effectively start pushing the boundaries and finding ways to meet the, the new demand curve. So increased impact of uh, renewable energy. So Energy and Markets and Swan Bank reviewed the operation of capabilities to determine the most effective options to support renewables in the market. Um, we transitioned from the original H profile, which is that um, peaking at in mornings and evenings and, and backing down to 95 megawatts in, in the other times. And then we've gone to what we call this market driven profile. And that name is, is very, very, um, Poignant because we are being driven by the market. No longer can we drive the market as we have to follow what the market is, is demanding. So what does that mean? Is generally we start around about 3 p.m. in the afternoon and run up to um, 11 p.m. at night. And again, that does change um, given on the market. If there's required for us to run through to catch this, this money in the market, we will run through. So that's led to us to have to be very flexible and dynamic. And as I said, we have to understand the machine. Um, when this machine was originally built in 2002, it was a two shifting unit. We used to start every day. Um, then we shifted into a base load unit. And now we've gone back into this starting every day. Um, a lot of the lessons learnt from that starting every day were forgotten. It's very easy to forget something. Um, so we're re relearning the unit, understanding the impacts. Um, the thermodynamic um, impacts on the HRSG, we have to look at um, the thermal fatigue that's coming in our HRSG, um, uh, the way the drains are operating, the way our blowdowns are operating to maximise the, the life of the unit. So this little graph here basically shows what we're competing against. So we can see these little blue section here where, you know, volume megawatts and you can see where the peaks are in the evenings and that's what we have to capture and that's what's driven swan bank to become a, a flexible unit and and challenge challenge the capabilities but when you challenge, challenge the capabilities of a unit you've got to really understand your unit and you've got to understand that nothing's for free so um starting a unit stopping a unit it, it, it's costing you somewhere whether it's in um, corrosion of the unit being um, parked up wet for a little while, um, whether it's thermally cycling, um, uh, EOH on the machine, um, you know, your boiler chemistry, again, nothing's for free. And we need to know where those pinch points were. So strategies to enable MDP. So um, again, we had to become a faster ramping unit. So we trialled up to 30 megawatts a minute um, fast ramp rate, uh, with GE. Um, that required some, um, some tests at various loads to understand the impact on the steam turbine, the gas turbine, the HRSG, um, again, even our cycle chemistry. Um, we were successfully, we successfully trialled up to 30 megawatts. Um, there are some implications if we do go down that 30 megawatt road um our original ramp rate was 11 and a half megawatts a minute um when we finished that that testing is there was no impediment for us to sit at 17 and a half megawatts a minute so we're 17 and a half megawatts a minute on our unit 
Um, there was no, no issues noted with the Hayes RSG with the increased ramp rate. Um, however, again, uh, since we've implemented that, we are still monitoring. We're, we're um, actively uh, taking a, a more NDT, understanding what's happening with this fast ramp rate. Because as I said, nothing is for free. Um, the next thing we implemented was the fast starts project. The, the advantage of the fast start project is um, instead of taking up to four and a half hours to get to our minimum load, we're effectively half that time to go to base load. So to capture those evening peaks, we are we can start later, get there sooner, and we're not wasting fuel gas um, with a very inefficient unit. Um, when we start, we sit around about 35% efficient until we can bring the steam turbine in, until the steam turbine's um, hot, until our boiler is up to temperature. Um, you know, we, we are wasting gas. So. The fast start project has been a great benefit for Swan Bank. However, there are some significant teething issues we've found um, in implementing that. So the main impacts were the uh, steam water cycle, steam turbine stress control. Um, the steam turbine stress control was in, um, uh, was addressed by um, having uh, faster acting probes installed into the steam turbine so that we can get a better understanding of the stress that's being induced by putting cold steam into the steam turbine and bring up temperature. Again, that allows us to push the machine a little bit harder to actually get the steam turbine in. Um, the other thing that was implemented was an economizer bypass. So it basically jumps out your economizer and puts cold water into your main steam to superheater so we get more range out of it. We found that um, when pushing the unit to ramp up, you have to condition your steam a lot harder. And if you use the economizer of water to your main steam to superheater, is you run out of room on your valve, so it caps out. So we lose control of the temperature of the steam, so we induce stress in the steam turbine. The economizer bypass is again, it allows cold water to go through that nozzle, so you don't need as much flow, so that you can actually maintain your steam temperature. Um, so we had to do the wide range of testing. So cold start, warm one, warm two start. Um, we didn't do a hot start, um, mainly because hot starts very rarely happen and there's no real advantage for plant fast start because your steam turbine is all ready to go. Your HRSG is at temperature, you're already at pressure. Um, we have found that with cold starts on a cold, cold start, we have some um, issues with the stress control and also issues with the uh, ramping rate of the HRSG um, temperatures. And we also tend to run out of room on our spray water um, control valve through the superheaters. Again, we're trying to temperate down very quickly on a very cold steam turbine. Um, we, the other significant issue has is with um, drum level control is we're finding that um, the fundamental laws of thermodynamics can't be changed. Um, we have tried, um, we, we've failed miserably at that. So we're finding that the IP drum on our unit is a small drum. Um, it's very susceptible to changes in pressures. So as our bypasses open, the pressure in the drum decreases. So our drum swells. And then once the pressure gets under control, the, uh, the level collapses. So we're having um, issues maintaining that. Um, we are working through those issues and trying to understand um, how we can better control those drum level. Um, uh, we've taken off a minimum opening of our, um, our IP feed water control valve. It was set at 10%, we've increased that to 20%. Um, we've had to slow down the rate of our IP bypass opening um, so that we don't have a massive drop in pressure. Um, we've put minimum openings on the um, IP bypass. In particular, when we come off, we've found that the IP bypass is opening too soon, which again was causing um, drum level collapse, um, which caused the unit to trip off. Um, the other thing was, is now we're doing these daily starts is we used to do a blow down every Friday afternoon when we're on all the time. So we do a blow down every Friday because the chemistry would be nice. Um, now if we trial doing a blow down at the end of the, um, the daily start, um, 
that was we'd get the chemistry right when shut the unit down and we'd start up again and our chemistry would be all over the shop. We've now switched to uh, on run up. We're doing uh, half an hour blow down on the IP, half an hour blow down on the LP and a 45 minute blow down on the HP. Um, we're having uh, quite good success with that. Our chemistry is um, getting really good really quickly. And we're finding that that um, on the next start, uh, it, it's taking less and less. And we have been working with um, thermal chemistry, um, working through through that and, and what options are available to actually to manage that. Um, with this market driven profile is we are limited to how long we can park the unit up. So uh, we have basically instructed our um, market and trading that if they need to shut us down for any more than three days, then we need to do preservation on our unit. Um, we are looking at ways of actually taking away that minimum time before we have to restart the unit. Um, we have seen on our um, GT bearing two, we've seen significant changes to the behavior of that bearing. Um, we've seen some significant um, high spikes on bearing R2 vibration. Um, it's only during startups. Um, once the unit is thermally stable, we see that bearing vibration drop down. So we're seeing because of this um, fast start, um, we're pouring a lot of energy into the gas turbine and it's thermally growing very quickly. Um, and that is causing an imbalance somewhere in, in the gas turbine. Um, we're not 100% sure what the, the smoking gun is for that. However, um, we believe that the unit is um, distorting somehow and it's being hung up. So it's it's grabbing, it's holding a lot of energy until it frees itself out. And we've seen these, these instantaneous step changes of up to five and a half millimeters a second on bearing two. Um, the other thing we had to do is now we've gone to this um, daily starts, um, starting in the afternoon, is we've had to work with our operators and work with operator maintainers into how we're gonna man the unit. Um, the good thing about Swan Bank is everyone is very accommodating, everyone's flexible, everyone understands the role of Swan Bank has changed. And for us to survive in the market, we all have to um, work together to ensure the longevity of the unit. So now our new shifts have gone from, we're a single man operator um, from midnight through to midday. And then we have the um, afternoon shift now where the second man comes in and supports the unit um, for run up. We also have implemented um, an operator that is in the workshop that is available if um, the unit has to either shut down late or start early in the day, we can man that, that requirement for the second operator. So if, um, how are we going to continue this flexibility? Um, you know, we, we have to keep getting ahead of the curve. We have to keep seeing what we can do for the unit. So the next phase is we're going to, we are looking at what the value is going from 17 and a half megawatts to 30 megawatts a minute. Um, what the implications are from going to that 30 megawatts a minute, because again, nothing is for free. We have to really understand the unit. Um, wet storage capability, as I discussed. So we're working with thermal chemistry to evaluate the best option um, products for use. Um, amines are a hot topic around the world at the moment, purely because of these units are now cycling, even the cold fires are starting to look at cycling. Um, we have, um, um, again, working with thermal chemistry. One thing we've found that to go to amines is we really need to understand the baseline of the unit now. So we're, we're collecting data, we're, we're assessing the health of the unit now, so that when we do go down the amines route, that we actually understand what the benefit is. And if it is a real benefit, and what we can upset by putting in amines. Um, we implemented a, a bespoke low load, um, which we went down to 95 megawatts, um, which is probably the lowest load for a GT26 in the world at the moment. Um, again, it was a bespoke design. Um, we have found that sitting at that low load is we have induced a lot more cracking in the exhaust gas housing. Um, 
and that's driven out of uh, thermally cycling and also uh, vortex shedding. Um, the flow that's coming out of the back of the gas turbine has changed its um, profile and we're finding that we're having vortex is um, being lifted off off the um, flow straighteners, which is causing a, a, a resonance in the exhaust gas housing. We've also noticed a lot more fretting in there. Um, and again, that probably comes back to the way we are uh, heating the gas turbine and pushing the gas turbine. It's thermally growing very rapidly and potentially unevenly. So we are addressing that. Um, and we've also found that we have minimum flow on the intemperator um, water spray valve. So um, at low load, they're set to two and a half percent minimum opening. Um, and at low load, we are cooling our steam below our set point, which is causing, you know, as we come back up from low load, we're finding that there is stress being induced in the steam turbine because the steam turbine is being cooled out. Um, we are trying to address that. We're looking at options for different temperated nozzles, um, looking at um, potentially putting in a, a, a bypass for that temperator so that it leaks off minimum flow so that we keep hot water always down to that temperator, but doesn't actually go through the nozzle. Um, we're seeing our OTC valves also, uh, once through cooler valves, is they're, they're operating around about um, 0.5 to 1%. Um, if you're aware of our OTCs, is the OTCs are seeing full feed pump pressure. Um, they're probably the most um, severe service valves on site. And when you operate at those low um, percentages, we're finding that we are tearing seats apart. Um, we did have the trim modified so that it's um, controlling around about 3%. But again, it's it's oscillating between 1% and 3% and it's it's tearing itself to pieces. So the, all these things that we've done, we're finding it's almost balance a plant that isn't um, working in its normal range, in its, in, its, in its perfect range, that we're pushing valves to their very limit and we're finding damage. But again, as I said, nothing is for free. It's a, a cost benefit. Um, and again, there's, uh, there's now in the, in the market this dynamic um, response and um, FCAS services, um, purely because uh, the way that renewables behave is you can lose 100 megawatts out of the market very quickly with solars and it comes back. Um, so those services are value of us. Um, we are looking at uh, increasing the service we can provide. So I think we provide one minute at the moment. Yeah, one minute um, raise. We're looking to what the unit is capable of to play in the other markets. And again, um, the dynamic response is it's all gas turbines. So um, the gas turbine provides the bulk of those additional megawatts and then the steam turbine catches up. And again, you're pouring a lot of energy into the gas turbine very quickly. And you see this thermal cycling and that thermal cycling also is impacting our HRSG. And that's the end of the presentation. Um, any questions from anyone? Any similar stories. Matt and John, thank you very much Keep it, for keeping us on time. We have, uh, I think, one one minute if anybody has, a, does anybody have a question? So, what was the so design Matt, RAM rate? Who, 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 who is that, please? This, this, is, uh, this is MD Mahmoud. What was the okay. design RAM rate? MD, so, yeah. The design ramp rate for the um, unit was 11 and a half megawatts a minute. Thank you. Good. Okay. So, yeah, Matt and John, it, um, it seems like that your new operation will be ideal to be tested with the new uh, iron monitoring process that IAPS has. And uh, you, you can see that at the I'm going to include that in the, in my presentation at the end of the day, so that'll be it'll be very useful. It it'll tell you uh, basically what uh, what are good starts and what are bad starts, and what are the processes that are are good to 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 reduce the amount of decay time uh, for that iron levels to get down to approximately normal levels. So you, you can see that, that you can see that at the at the end of the day. But da, but but David could share that with you as well, um, uh, uh, as he's involved with you. 
So thank you. Uh, we we have. Uh, if anybody else has any questions, we have at the uh, at the at, after the next presentation. So uh, thanks uh, thanks very much again, and we'll move now to uh, from HRSGs to conventional uh, to conventional boilers and uh, an MD that just spoke. Um, I I think um, is next. And can you introduce yourself and uh, and start your presentation, MD, please? Um, thank, uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for making time to this presentation. Um, excuse me for my accent. Um, uh, I will share my screen. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Put it on full screen and it'll be okay. Yep. Um, this is uh, yeah, now. Good. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you very much. Uh, this is MD Mahmoud, Senior Engineer, Boiler Section at uh, AGL Macquarie, uh, who is runs um, Lidl and Base Water Power Station. I'm going to talk about the management of corrosion fatigue cracking at Lidl. Uh, before that, I want to introduce the um, a brief in, in introduction of the Lidl power station. This is a uh, 500 megawatt four unit station, uh, tangential coal fired boiler. We have boiler circulation pump for force cir circulation of the work water in the water wall. We have divided furnace, furnace um, to make it uh, two furnace A and B side for balanced draft operation. This unit was commissioned in early 70s and planned closer in 2023, uh, though unit three will be earlier in next year, April. So other, other th uh, three units will be one year later. The corrosion fatigue, uh, this corrosion fatigue is a cracking mechani mechanism under cyclic loading at boiler attachment and under corrosive environment, especially low pH. And this cracking start usually uh, at the board of the tubes. And you can see this cracking, there is no particular direction it can go in any direction uh, on left hand side photos this is the um, photo of the pore of the cracking after uh, cleaning of the pore and on right hand side you can see the all, all this external attachment where this corrosion uh, fatigue cracking can happen This corrosion fatigue failure has a uh, great consequence. There's two types of consequence. One is high frequency, low consequence. That is small opening, just a pinhole leak, um, and just just a uh, production loss. The other one is is low frequency, high consequence, where you can see a big opening of the tube. Sorry, uh, here you can see big opening, and here you can see this smashed or all, all those things. This photo uh, have been taken from the water wall corrosion fatigue life management by Epri. There is a paper written by Epri. I, I took this for these two photos from that papers. On right hand side, you can see this is not the corrosion fatigue failure. But this was another type of failure, external failure, and this was about 300 millimeter opening, external opening of the water wall. So you can see if someone is in, in that vicinity, probably it will be you know, dead. So this, is, uh, this has very high consequence 
if it goes wrong. I want to give you the history of the fatty failure at, at, at Lidl. This first, this, this type of failure discover, discovered in mid 80s. At that time, those, uh, those failures are detected at the lower part of the boiler and lower part of the, um, the backstays and, and the boiler openings. At that time, plant were modified and targeted tube replacement was done to address the issue. We, we have seen this failure again in, uh, in 2020. This time, uh, most of the failure was uh, from burner corner. It, uh, this is inside of the boiler. Um, the burner finishes he here. Yeah, this is the last um, burner. So just below the burner, but the burner box attached on the other side, the non-fire side. Um, that location has the failure first at Lidl. Um, sorry, why it's not going next slide. To understand and address this issue, um, we followed the EPRI guideline. The EPRI has, has a paper on water wall corrosion fatigue life management. We follow that nine steps to address the corrosion fatigue issue at boil, uh, water wall boiler. We follow this, we review the water chemistry and operational uh, history. We did the metallurgical analysis to confirm that those failures uh, were the fatigue failure. We did the environmental factor assessment. We did some destructive examination, some, some net non-destructive examination on potential locations. Through these guidelines, we first identify where that location, where that uh, corrosion fatigue can can be, and we did those examination to find out the locations. We also engaged the world expert, um, structural integrity to do a finite element analysis to determine the critical sizes um, operating in space. We also um, installed the strain gauge to understand how the strain is is acting on those locations where we have the uh, corrosion fatigue failure. That uh, the NDT was a bit challenging because uh, when we, we found that problem, so at that time we had available technology is phased array, which requires um, extensive su surface preparation. And the other dis disadvantage of phased array is um, the one crack can mask with the other cracks, uh, as you know. So phased array was not quite right and what was very time consuming to do the testing. We could do another convention of radiography, but that required ex big exclusion zone, and it does not give us the depth of the crack. So we, um, we as a group um, at AZL, Macquarie, and with our um, central group, in engineering services group, we look for the uh, better technology, and we found IRIS NDT, they have the um, digital radiographic capability. This requires a little surface preparation, and this is small exclusion zone, quick uh, method, and visually, you can see the crack visually, and you can determine that 
depth of the crack um, at plus minus 10 percent it's 0 0.2, 0 0.2 millimeter accuracy so this is the test piece this is the test piece and this is the actual crack the with that test piece has definite crack uh, depth this is compared with the um, digit uh, the gray scale is uh, compared in in the com in the computer so it gives us a very good uh, size 0.2 millimeter accuracy we did that uh, on few locations we did all the burner corners on unit one and two and selected box stay where where that corrosion fatigue can happen uh, from our initial desktop assessment which we, we selected those box stays we did the uh, that twin shot drt on sidewall gasset plate we replace uh, about 50 tubes on ec unit um, which had more than 20 percent crack through on, on the water wall. We haven't done on unit three and four yet. Uh, this, um, these two units are barricaded currently on that potential uh, areas. Unit three will, will be retired, will be shut down in, in five months time. So unit three will not be done. Uh, unit four, we haven't, done on unit 48 because this is a uh, newest uh, unit and we did not have any failure so far so still we haven't planned but if we have any failure then we have to do uh, otherwise that barricading for next you know, few, um, maybe 16 months Uh, to determine the critical size and you know potential failure um, orientation uh, we, we get a help from structural integrity to determine the critical flow size they did the modeling uh, a number of direction of the flow uh, orientation and flow location and operating condition and that uh, model found that the axially oriented flows for cold side tube crown or member, if the flow is less than 35.56 millimeter length, the critical flow depth is 3.65 millimeter, which is 80% of the um, minimum wall thickness. The, uh, our water wall tube uh, thickness is 4.5 millimeter. If the uh, flow is greater than 35.56, then depth is 3.15. Similar for uh, hot side tube, flow length less than 39.37, the critical depth is 3.65, which is 80% 80, 80 of the wall thickness. If it is greater than 39.37, it's 3.22. That is seventy one percent for circumferential uh, oriented flows. Is depth critical depth is three point five eight, which is seventy eight percent of the thickness. We have installed the um, strain gauge and thermocouples in few locations to understand how that strain is. Um, behaving we, we want to understand the operating drivers uh, whose operation mode is uh, is is creating creating the um, the fa uh, fatigue uh, corrosion and based on that we want to um, manage that you know uh, the operating drivers here is some trend from from the strain gauge. On left hand side, this is during normal operation. During the shutdown, is gone up, and then come down. This is offline strain. 
uh, we have uh, six strain gas in six different locations. This is um, during RTS, and again this is after um, after RTS during the normal operation. This is uh, based on different load profile. Um, this is during forced cool, and this is uh, during natural cool. You can see that the big um, spike during art during taking out of service, and this is offline. Uh, sorry, this is uh, this is this is uh, taking out of service. This one is when boiler was drained. This is only few hours after the boiler drain. It does not have uh, this one does not have the um, RTS strain. This was a uh, team effort uh, from FD on boiler engineer, inc including the leaders, uh, engineering services group, water chemistry group, maintenance outage of operation, and the contractor as well, TWPS, UGL, ALS. Iris NDT and structural integrity. So we work as a team to manage this corrosion fatigue at Lidl. Um, there's a, a, a pre uh, document number 10455. There's a uh, warning there where you need to look for the corrosion fatigue failure. So this this is the summary of, of the things you need to consider for corrosion fatigue failure where it can happen. Um, if you read through this document, you will have very good understanding what you need to do for management of corrosion fatigue failure. Any question? Thank you. Thank you, MD. That was a very nice uh, overview of all, all the work that was that, that took place there. Does anybody have any any questions for MD? I don't. Uh, hang on a second. So, I'm looking. There was one here uh, from uh, from Mr. Gray. If you want, Bob. Yeah. Uh... I'll just read it real quick. Did you make any improvements to reduce the corrosion fatigue? Um, yes, that uh, the, the strain gas uh, data we we are analyzing to determine you know which operate operation mode is detrimental for the corrosion fatigue failure. That's that is one uh, improve improvement we are going to do. So we have already done, you know, the initial thought was that the natural, the force cooling is, is, is the main driver. So we are not doing any uh, force cooling, but, you know, we, we need to analysis, we need to do the analysis further to see which one is, is detrimental and we'll implement that. Though we have only little time to, uh, uh, little time, uh, uh, time remaining for the station is not far away from shutting it down. Okay, we have another question for you from uh, Paul uh, Rugrock. Um, has there been any water wall cold side corrosion fatigue failures at Lydell? Uh, we do not have any cold side failures so far. Whatever mm -hmm. failure we we seen. All uh, uh, at port side. Oh, it's, it's good news for now, right? <laughs> yes, <laughs> that is that is the good news for Lidl so far. Yes, in terms uh, of corrosion fatigue failure. Okay, we have another question. Just came from Mark Wyburn. Are you paying for the sins of the past, or has some of the damage been done recently? Yeah. Um, one of the slide, if you remember that this corrosion fatigue failure first discovered in mid 80s. So it's, it's not new thing. So at that time it was 
at the lower part of the boiler and uh, in in some back stays and you know almost half half elevation of the back stay were, were modified at the time and a lot of tube was replaced so um i i would say it, it, it might not be the new thing you know this site was not that bad so um, definitely it is not a new thing it had little had history of corrosion fatigue failure so md md i i i guess that mark might, might be asking if there were any uh chemistry ex uh, uh, problems in in the past and and uh, you can indicate that we did we did look at those yes uh chemistry yes we had some issue with water chemistry in past yeah this was uh reviewed and and found out some problem with what water chemistry uh there's a lot of air increase and and low pH uh, occurrence few times. Okay, we have uh, we have a few questions for Matt. Um, so don't don't ask. Yeah, so, so Mark, we, we, before we do that, we we just said we just should say thanks to MD, and uh, maybe another question will come in for him, and we'll and then we can move to the uh, the question and answer session, the general sessions yeah. for both of them. Uh, MD, thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for uh, for uh, everyone making this time, and thanks for giving me um, opportunity to, to present this. Thank you. Yeah, great. It's still a it's still a very important mechanism, uh, and you know ha ha having having a proper approach like uh, you you have indicated is uh, very important for. If any, if any of the other participants uh, uh, find themselves in a corrosion fatigue situation, yeah, it, it's right up there with FAC from a from a personnel risk standpoint. When you start yeah. these exterior failures as well, yeah. much more, much more important in the in the um, in the conventional boilers than in HRSGs. But we have. We have MD seen some corrosion fatigue in uh, some of the HRSG components, mainly in the in the uh, low pressure economizers. Um, but but it's not a it's not as large a problem as in the conventional boilers. Yeah. All right. We have a couple of questions from Matt. Um, yeah. I don't know the the person asking this first one, but what was the minimum load? You're achieving, I think you said 26 megawatts as the lowest. What is your typical uh, minimum? So the original MEL for the unit was 150 megawatts. Um, we're now down to 95 megawatts. Okay. Um, the one thing about going down to 95 megawatts is we're actually taking the steam turbine out of sliding pressure mode and we're throttling the um, control valves to maintain minimum pressure. Yeah. Okay. So again, um, nothing's for free. We will be seeing some. Um, uh, uh, increased degradation across those control valves. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is the steam turbine participating in the frequency control? Yes, is the short answer. Um, single shaft machine, the steam turbine is always trying to um, outdo the, the gas turbine in terms of RPM, so the clutch always stays engaged, so it's always putting energy in. Okay. Uh, another question from Lester Stanley. Um, since it's a single shaft machine, can it ramp up the CT to full load uh, while waiting for the steam turbine to warm up? Um, we do have a bypass um, mode available. Um, so we can run the gas turbine to um, base load. However, to pick up the steam turbine in that mode is we have to run the gas turbine back down to about 18 megawatts and then pick the steam turbine up. Um, given that you're in bypass mode, you're putting a lot of energy. It is, is designed to go full bypass mode, but a lot of energy is being dumped into the condenser. Um, so you, you basically really hammer the condenser. It's not ideal. Uh, we have run in bypass mode for a couple of weeks um, when we lost the triple S clutch and we couldn't engage the steam turbine. 
Okay. Uh, uh, there is a, a package out there that does allow for you to go to base load on the gas turbine and bring the steam turbine in at any load. However, it requires some significant changes to your HRSG, a um, couple of interstaged superheaters to be able to manage your, your steam temperature so that you're not putting red hot steam into your steam turbine and inducing those thermal stresses. Yeah, so your configuration is only um, terminal point temperation, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, also from uh, Lester, do uh, you have any struggles with reheat or HP superheater tube metal temperatures when trying to ramp fast? Um, with no, generally no. We do see um, with our not so much on ramping. It's on our minimum load. We are seeing some elevated temperatures there because the steam flow is so low through our um, superheaters. Us, yeah, that we are seeing elevated temperatures there. So we're not cooling the tubes because we don't have the steam flow. Right. Yeah. Well, that'll probably be something to watch. Um, from a uh, degradation standpoint, depending on how hot they're getting. Um, Look, um, what we've what we've done now is we've made so many um, changes on our unit, which you know, again, if you think about engineering practice, you change one thing and you see how it goes. Um, we've changed a couple of things now, so we've we've almost put a hiatus on any other changes, and we're monitoring and understanding what the the impact of what we've done is before we start progressing. Um, some of these further projects that we're looking at to give us more flexibility. Yeah, that's good strategy. Otherwise, you'll be so wrapped around the axle, you don't know which way to go. Yep. I'm just jumping there, Bob. Um, yeah, we're saying about 605, 610 degrees C on the superheaters um, in low load, which is in that creep zone for P91. But then again, you've got to keep in mind the boiler pressure's half pressure anyway. So, um, we, we do inspections every, every time we come off for a major inspection, like our C inspection and, and look, there's, there's some evidence of some creep, but very little. Uh, before you, before you, well, uh, it all depends on, on the temperatures themselves. Uh, but, you know, you might also watch for increased, um, oxide internal, internal oxide growth and formation accelerating based on these higher temperatures um, yes. as opposed to that could get you in trouble maybe cause problems before uh, you have actual you know creep damage to yeah the material. yeah yeah so yeah so so that's quite important John and Matthew Bob, Bob and I are just working at the moment on 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 a situation like that and you will both remember at the last two um, at, the, at the last two uh, ABHOG meetings, I made a presentation on on the oxides, and uh, uh, if you take any tubes out of those uh, sections, you can basically see where you are in the overall sort of life of the superheater or reheater tube, and uh, just from the from the oxide uh, morphology, so it's something to look look out for. Yeah, we might schedule to take a tube sample in the next major inspection, especially after these daily starts and the like, low load running and the like. Because uh, yeah. we did take a superheater tube um, sample early in its life, so we do have something to compare against. Yeah, yeah, John, and you can compare it either with the presentation that I gave or the or the or the open publication that, that's uh, that, that, that's available. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Barry. Uh, we have another question for Matt from uh, Evan Corbett. He says, a few years ago, Swan Bank went to an extended wet layup of 20 to 25 days. It, that's his recollection of the duration. Uh, are you still at that or has it been decreased to assist with the psychochemistry cleanup for the fast start? Yeah, no, Bob, we've decreased that back again. Um, we did a couple of trials at that 21 days plus, um, you know, that cycle of 28 days and, and we're showing evidence that it was, it was, you know, potentially, um, going to increase the impact of damage on the boiler on the HRSG. So we've actually backed that down and, and we, we were, cause we were wet storing for 16 days, you know, um, but even now with our whole running profile. Uh, it's not really part of that 
option anymore. Um, we're looking more at the flexibility. If we're going to wet store, that's why we're talking A means that we can actually just market trading can just make the call any time to say like we want to bring the unit off and leave it wet for a week and with a with a four hour recall or whatever it is, you know. So that that's what we're looking at. Okay. Yeah. So let's we've have we have another question for uh, MD um, from Luke Burns. Have you have you found much evidence of corrosion fatigue in the Baywater boilers, Bayswater water boilers? Bayswater. Yeah. Bayswater. I think uh, just they found a uh, little bit corrosion. It, it's not failure, but from another failure they did the um, examination and found that um, uh, the corrosion fatigue is present there. Um, I, I need to confirm that one. Um, Riley it's can true. answer that one. Uh, Riley can answer that one. I think Riley is in the meeting. My manager. He probably dropped out, I think, MD. Stuart, man, yeah. yeah. So, yes, there has been some corrosion fatigue, and but we don't think it's actually led to the actual being the primary cause of any failures. They're doing some work at the moment to explore that a bit further, going through some of that um, there was nine step every type program just to understand the, the likely locations at Bayswater. Um, one of the things that may come into play is that when we looked at the strain gauge data, and this is still being assessed for Liddell, we originally perhaps anticipated that um, forced cools would be more damaging than a natural cool where we didn't actually run the BCPs. But we can get some. Um, force cool events, if we control the cooling rate sufficiently slowly, that are less damaging than a natural um, cooling event is. Now, that may have implications for Bayswater that doesn't actually have BCPs. So, we can't, we will get during a, any rundown, any cooling, we will be getting significant cycles on there. Now, for a base loaded station, that might not be an issue. But if over the next 10, 15 years, we start to operate Bayswater differently and need to come offline more often, then that may have impacts there. So it's one of the things perhaps to understand that the, the base load stations like Bayswater may um, change from being maybe a little bit of susceptibility to corrosion fatigue, but not actually give you grief to um, cycling more often and that becoming an issue. That's something to be aware of. Good. We have one, have one, one more, one more question, Bob, and then we're yeah, open. yeah, from uh, uh, Evan Corbett again to MD. Um, during low load, I'm sorry, Matt and John. During low load operation, are you seeing uh, phosphate hideout? And if so, how are you rectifying that? Uh, yes, is the short answer. Um, so we are turning off um, phosphate dosing um, when we come below 130 megawatts, I think, um, and just managing it that way. Um, uh, Brad, our chemist, is is um, been talking with uh, thermal chemistry around um, phosphate hydro. We did look at switching from phosphate to caustic. Um, so, um, but given that we're looking at A means, we're going to stay with phosphate. We seem to have it um, a bit better under control now. Now we know what what causes it. Um, turning off the phosphate dosing as before we come down and load has has seen um, uh, significant improvements in managing our phosphate levels. Mm. So, so Matt and and, uh, and Evan, I think we must say that um, uh, that phosphate hideout has a bad name. But when you only use uh, TSP like uh, uh, like you do, uh, th there's nothing harmful in having a phosphate hideout and return. You know, it's it's uh, it only it in terms of availability or reliability, it only becomes a little control problem. So, um, uh, uh, Bob, um, I, I think we should just uh, I think we should just have this one question, and then we can um, f finish this section. Yeah, yeah, and well, this question may lead to some general discussion as well, um, as I have a few follow-ups when we get to the other session. So, this is from uh, 
Ronald Colon uh, for Matt. Um, Ronald says they are now started, have started to change their operating mode uh, with bypassing steam to the condenser um, during low system load. Um, so far, they haven't seen any damage, and he's he's wondering if you have seen any early signs of any issues uh, from bypass operation. Um, we generally not uh, don't do bypass, but with this daily starts, is again we're seeing a lot more um, secondary damage on um, things like our IP bypass control valve because it is throttling, working very hard. We're finding that we have to look at that valve pretty much every time um, we come for an inspection, where we have to lap the seat, lap the plug. Um, we're seeing a lot more damage on um, our. Uh, Blow down valves, our um, drain valves, because again, during run up, you're trying to maintain your drum levels. Um, they're opening and closing and they're pinching. So we're seeing a, a bit more wear across those. Um, but we, we haven't seen any detrimental in the condenser, though. But again, um, on full bypass mode, we, you are putting a lot of energy into that condenser. Yeah. yeah. Okay, right. that's good. That's good, I think, Bob. Yep. Um, so. Um, uh, Matt, Matt and John, thanks very much. And uh, you, you mentioned uh, you mentioned uh, more than a couple of times about moving to amines, but I think you mean film forming substances, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, sorry, that's just just what's being called around here, amines. Uh, I'm I'm going to in, uh, I'm going to include a discussion on film forming substances in the last presentation today. So thanks very much to uh, to John and to, and to Matt and to MD and uh, let's go on for the first uh, for the first presentation um, on uh, from a sponsor and Nathan uh, if you're there please please uh, proceed. Do we have uh, Scott? Do you have to activate him? Hear me? Do you have to uh, uh, activate his sound or or let him in? Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah. yeah good. Okay. Yep. Sorry about that. Everything was working fine, and then it wasn't. So <laughs> we can't we can't see you. That's all. We can't see your slides. Oh, there you go. Oh, there you go. Okay. All right. Can you see that? Perfect. Yeah. All right. I'll, I'm sorry. Uh, so my name's uh, Nathan Leonard. I'm the uh, director of sales for uh, Latin America as well as APAC for Century Equipment. A lot of you may be familiar with us already. Um, for, for those of you who aren't, I'll tell you a few things about the company and then um, additionally some things from a quality perspective that I think you'll find uh, helpful and hopefully interesting. Uh, we, uh, of course, work with uh, our partners at Duffin Macintosh in Australia and New Zealand. Um, I'll mention a bit more about them, but they are our co-sponsors uh, for this event. Um, as far as Century Equipment is concerned, uh, we have uh, actually a little bit more than 165 employee owners. We are an employee-owned company uh, with our headquarters in Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. Uh, we also have our Process Monitoring Technical Center in Houston. Uh, we participate in support and sales activities across 55 countries and six continents, and we've been in business almost 100 years. Uh, you can see some of the other claims to fame here that we've been in business, or, sorry, uh, operating 22 consecutive years without a safety incident. Um, 77 of our customers are in the Fortune 500, 20 in the Forbes America's largest private uh, companies list, and we are 100% employee owned. Um, which we've found uh, creates a, a good amount of personal buy-in from our employees and really backs up our customer commitment. Uh, our goal is to safeguard people and processes. In this case, um, it's sample conditioning uh, for power plants, uh, provide an accurate and repeatable sample that can be analyzed and can provide the data necessary for a plant to be operated in peak condition and to um, avoid any damage to the environment or uh, to workers. Uh, you can see here we have our main facility, which is a little over 66,000 square feet. Uh, 
you can see a number of our uh, certifications, uh, notably our ASME Section 8 certification, which I'll touch on in just one moment. Uh, we've been partners with Duffin McIntosh for roughly 50 years. They are our longest standing commercial partnership. Uh, we've been dealing with uh, Jonathan Orban for quite some time, and I've been with the company five years. Um, and I've been very, very happy to see um, their capabilities. Uh, Duffin Mac, they're highly skilled in SWAS design, um, as well as fabrication support and local installation. Uh, as far as uh, some of the challenges that we run into in uh, uh, engineering construction and, and sampling uh, would be outdated sampling specifications or incomplete bids where we need to provide some guidance. Um, and then generally being presented bids uh, or, or specifications that are designed in an unsafe manner. So we're able to influence those specifications to drive safety forward and for the best interest of the customer. Um, as you can see here, it's noted that we work with five of the 10 uh, global EPC firms and most recently uh, working directly with Toshiba Power uh, out of Yoka uh, Yokohama. As far as the power market goes, um, what are some of the sampling challenges? Well, I think just about everybody on the call um, could acknowledge some of these. Um, you have cycle chemistry issues, which we've heard a little bit about uh, thus far, thermal management of sample coolers, um, stringent environmental requirements, and one that we run into, um, counterfeit and misrepresented products. And while imitation could be said to be the most sincere form of flattery, um, it's certainly not something that you want in uh, you know, uh, an environment where people could be hurt or uh, equipment could be severely damaged. Uh, standards uh, sentry panels would uh, last about 25 to 30 years with good cooling water. Um, we have a very, very low failure rate um, when cooling water is taken into co uh, consideration. And I mentioned that we would touch on the ASME Section 8 certification. Um, what we're running into a lot is um, we'll see sample coolers that provided the power plants that claim technical compliance um, with the ASME use stamp requirement, but claiming compliance doesn't make it true. Um, a use stamp must be permanently affixed, pin stamped um, on a, a pin stamp nameplate with ASME Clover. Uh, use stamp certification also requires independent third party inspection and witness. And the big news is as of today, 15 November my time, 16 for you in Australia, um, Central Equipment Corporation will offer complimentary use stamp sample coolers for projects in both South America and APAC. So we'll, we will uh, add that use stamp verification at no additional cost uh, on the project. As an example of what we're seeing, you can see to the left here, a non-code certified cooler that claims ASME Section 8, and to the right, a correct authorized product labeling uh, for ASME use stamp. You can see that it's permanently affixed, and that's witnessed every Thursday at our plant. Uh, what could this lead to? Well, if you misrepresent compliance with your product, um, you could have something like this. Well, without naming any names, I'll say that the failure at the upper flange of the cooler resulted in the constant release of steam into the SWAS lab at the facility. Um, the coolers were represented to be ASME compliant and you stamped hydrostatically tested, which I have my doubts. Um, and the cooler failure created the potential for severe bodily harm, damaged associated equipment, and forced plant downtime. So the key is we want to make sure that our customers realize the commitment that we have to them, that our equipment lasts for as long as possible, um, and that they understand that we're not in for a, a quick deal. We're in it for the long haul, and our commitment to that has stood for almost 100 years. So if you're looking for quality, if you're looking for a genuine product, um, no counterfeits, and that you know has been hydrostatically tested and carries the use stamp designation, Century Equipment and Duffin Mac would be the partners you'd be looking for. Uh, as far as training and consulting, we are always available to offer training to help reduce your operating costs and ensure plant safety and decrease downtime. And we have a ton of industry resources. If you reach out to me or to our partners at Duff and Mac, we'll be more than happy um, to put you in touch with, uh, you know, a, a training session or technical guides or anything that you might uh, find useful for your plant. That's all I've got, Baron. 
Uh, Nathan, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. That was uh, that was excellent. And uh, what 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 we'll do? I'm sure you will be very pleased to receive uh, emails uh, from any of the participants. And uh, Scott, uh, I hope we'll put his uh, we'll we'll put that contact address in in the uh, in the chat column. Thanks Certainly. very much, and thanks very much to uh, to uh, to Duff and Mac. Uh, they're probably they're probably the uh, oldest association with AHUG and APHUG, um, as far, as far back as I can remember. Anyway, so thanks very much. Thank you. So let's, so Thank let's you. move ahead. Uh, and Bob, are you are you're going to chair this uh, the second the second session, right? Sure. So David Addison, front and center. I've been looking forward to this uh, presentation David's going to make on uh, electric boilers. He tells me it's a new wave coming. So David, are you there? Hello, David. Yeah, I think I am. Hang on, I'm just getting the share going. Which one you got? No, you got the right screen or the other screen? Uh, you. We need the other screen. Easy. How's that? All right. Can you hear me? Okay. Can you see me? Okay. All that stuff. I can. I can. That's good. You have, the, you have the custom background and everything. Good for you. Oh, God, I get the brownie points. All right. Good to good to virtually see everyone. Um. I think like Bob and Barry, I've been to every every A hug and every A B hug and always thoroughly enjoy it. Uh, it's good to catch up with everyone and talk and trying to continue my tradition of giving you guys something a little bit a little bit different here. And this is this is these are these boilers, um, these electrode boilers are becoming very popular in New Zealand. We'll go through the reasons why. And um, you know, they may be coming to Australia uh, at some point. So this is just a little bit of an introduction to them. Um, some of the things that are going on, some of the work that IAPS is doing in this area, and um, yeah, give you a bit of a bit of a heads up. So we'll run through a few bits here, um, background a bit on IAPS and a bit of introduction to the technology and, and some of the applications. And like all these things, there's pros and cons, and, and then there's problems and solutions, and then we'll wrap up. So where did my interest come from out of these? Well, it's it's they've sort of spooled out of. Um, Bit of an IAPS sort of working group between New Zealand and, and the Scandinavian the SIAPS um, group, which have a lot of these units as well. They're very, very common in the Nordic countries um, and they're becoming more common here. And, and what we found is that we were identifying problems. Um, there wasn't any guidance for them um, in terms of similar to the IAPS TGDs or anything like that. Um, there's a little bit of old guidance and some old British standards, but therefore what we call low voltage um, boilers, but not really much for the high voltages. And everybody was sort of having a few issues. So we, we sort of joined forces to combine a bit of knowledge and experience and, and a bunch of this work's come out of that. Um, and, and some of the issues that we see, uh, it sounds pretty similar to all boilers, you know, potential corrosion and steam contamination and internal damage, all, all the sort of usual stuff, but with a bit of a different twist. And what we're hoping for in a, in a few years is whether we can put together an IAPS TGD to help provide some some industry and global guidance um, to help both um, you know operators and, and constructors and designers of these plants. So yeah, hopefully in the future um, you'd see a a, 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 um, a TGD uh, for electrode boilers in the IAPS list here. And just as a refresher to everyone, the, these are all the current IAPS TGDs. Um, you know, and if you're if you're after anything around film formers or generators or um, hair and leakage, as one is there, you know, evaporators, you know, all the information, etc., is there. So that should be your number one go-to. And just a quick introduction to IAPS. I mean, Barry will talk about this as well, but um, I just put my hat on now that I'm I'm now the recently a, a appointed uh, chairperson of the Power Cycle Chemistry Group, um, taking over from our good friend Michael Chair. So what's IAPS? You know. What's the objectives? You know, advance the knowledge, properties of water and steam and aqueous systems, and, 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 and in particular around industry, and to make that knowledge freely available to um, engineers and scientists the world over. So, just a refresher there's all the various IAPS uh, working groups. 
DPWS, uh, sort of physical properties of water and steam, industrial requirements, subcommittee on seawater, physical chemistry, aqueous solutions. And the one here that's probably of most interest to us is the power cycle chemistry group, which is where most of the work happens. And you know, obviously steam tables, every boiler needs a steam table. And just a little plug for the NZ apps um, group here. So what's what's happening with e-boilers? So we've seen basically what I'd say is pretty rapid adoption of, of electro boilers or e-boilers in New Zealand. And these are primarily um, displacing old industrial coal and gas boilers and, and that's for process heating applications. So that's where you need steam in a, in a dairy processing plant or a wool plant or any sort of industrial process could be meat processing or, or you know, wood fiber processing or things like that. Anywhere where you want saturated steam primarily. In New Zealand, we're pretty lucky. We've got a lot of renewable generation, hydro and, and geothermal and wind. Um, you know, basically sort of more than 70% of the grid most of the time. And also the New Zealand government has, has put some pretty major incentives in there to phase out old fossil plants. Essentially, you're not allowed to build any more coal boilers um, and you have to look pretty hard at would you build gas. And, and what we're finding is the e-boilers are coming in as well as a greater uptake of biomass plants and also high temperature heat pumps, which don't really have any water steam chemistry in them. So we're not going to talk about those. And, and I would say that, you know, they're coming in Australia um, as, as you get further push to decarbonisation. What powers them, however, let's wait and see, because um, you don't really want to, um, yeah, you've got to be a bit careful there where your, where your energy source comes from. So there's three main types in, in the global market, and, and, and these combine both hot water and steam systems, and, and there's the what they call the immersion type, which is just your hot water jug and kettle. There's a low voltage, and they just produce hot water or steam. There's the immersion electro type high voltage, and this is water as electrical conductor, and this is what we're going to talk about. These are sort of the main ones. And then there's another type called the jet type electro type, and again, water as electrical conductor, and those more more common in the US, but um, we're not going to really touch on those because the immersion type is the main one here. Um, you know, and and around the world, very common um, in, in nuclear and industrial plants for providing initial startup steam. So displacing a little fossil package boiler. Um, so providing you know warming steam or gland seal steam for turbines or, or to to get industrial processes up that are exothermic. Um, and then we also see a lot of them, um, you know, in chemical plants and, and other process plants around the world. You know, places like Norway, a lot of hydro electricity. They tend to have a lot of them as well. And then we also see them becoming very, very common in the district heating systems as well. So this is when um, you've got an excess of perhaps uh, renewable offshore wind power. Um, you would shut down your fossil system, whether that's a coal or a gas plant or a biomass plant, and then the electro boiler takes over to provide the, the district heating. So there's your what what your immersion type is, and this is actually in a it's actually an Australian plant, I'm the only one I've ever seen in the world. Often Pine Creek plant up in the Northern Territories is a little um, immersion element type for providing startup steam, which is they don't really need to use it anymore. Um, this is a jet type, which has a, a, a you know, basically a, a jetting electrode, the water's jetting across and providing the current path, but we won't worry about those today. And then this is the, the high voltage immersion type. Oh, sorry. And, um, you know, these units here, um, you know, it's it's a sort of a tall cylindrical vessel. We have the water level in here, the, the feed water's coming in, and it's and it's got a circulation pump. And it's um and it's 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 pumping the water up into this basket where the, uh, the electrodes come down and this is the this is the current in and this is the earth part and then it's the the amount of water that's basically covering the electrodes dictates how much steam you're going to get formed and that that's that's your that's your basic basic setup there so low thermal mass very fast responses and um and produce just saturated steam so that's the, that's the steam version and the and what they call the hot water types very very similar. They have a very similar setup. They have nitrogen over pressure on top, so you don't get any steam formation, and then you are circulating that water out through a heat exchanger and producing heat out to a secondary um, secondary loop over here. And, and there's a few different variations on this, but that's essentially what they are. So, how do they work? Well, you know, you're using electrical energy to generate steam, and and it's not an immersion heater like like the electrodes here don't actually, you know, they're not heating up per se, what you're getting is the current comes down, 
and this is the earth and the current actually flows through the water and it's the electrical resistance of the water that leads to resistance heating. Um, so that water is, is part of the electrical circuit, um, it's acting as an electrolyte and then as that, as that current flows through the water heats up and then you'll get your steam forming and it, and it exits and it, and it flows up through the, through the separator, the demisters, same as in a conventional boiler, then you go and make um, very, very high pure, but you know, very high purity um, saturated steam, you know, you get very good separation, um, you get very good purity, very dry steam, so it's good for the, good for the process. You know, and and you get steam and, and hot water um, with like nitrogen over pressure, but they only produce saturated steam. Okay, if you want superheated steam for whatever reason, you have to provide some additional heating. You have some other heat source to, to superheat that steam. Okay, so you can't produce superheated steam in the boiler itself. And, and these boilers are, are very efficient. You know, suppliers normally will, will, will state greater than 99% um, efficiency at, at converting the electrical energy into, into steam. Um, normally at, at full load at MCR. And the only real ways that we can lose energy from the system is if there's a problem with insulation or there's blowdown or there's steam leaks or there's or there's some electrochemical problem going on in here. Okay, and the and these and these range from very small, you know, a few hundred kilowatts and, and there's sort of you know 60 plus megawatt units on the market. And we are aware of some prototype units running up to sort of hundred bar um, pressure. So they're getting pretty high pressure. Um, and, and very, very large. So what have we got in New Zealand? Um, there's, there's a number of small domestic building type systems out there. Um, Auckland Medical School, we know this has put a bunch in and this is providing like sterilization steam, um, sort of a, at point sources, replacing a whole bunch of little gas fired boilers through the facility. And they've got two large um, resistance electrode units, so immersion electrode types. And these were supplied by a company called Energy Part Solutions in New Zealand, and they are basically, you know, they have displaced what would otherwise be a coal boiler going in. Um, you know, it's an expansion of uh, two dairy facilities, and these boilers have displaced the, the building of a coal plant. So, first one's at a facility called Sinlay, which is a dairy factory. Um, it's six megawatts, but it's actually a twelve megawatt size unit. It's been it's been um, future proofed with more capacity. So it has 12, it's 12 megawatts in size, there's 12 megawatt electrodes, but it's only got six megawatts of electricity supply. About 10, 10 cube an hour, around 10 bar, um, that was commissioned in 2019. There's another unit, open country, it's 13 megawatts, about 20 um, tons an hour of steam, similar pressures, 10, 11 bar, commissioned 2020. There's multiple projects in the tendering and project stages underway in New Zealand. Um, and there's there's multiple local vendors in the market, um, either bringing in European or, or, or Chinese technology or good technology, and it's all good developing base of, um, experience going on. Um, yeah, and you know this is what's coming in New Zealand. I'm not aware of any large ones in Australia yet, but I suspect they'll be they'll be coming. What do these things look like? Um, here's here's one here, the Sinlay plant. This is the the e boiler here. This is the deaerator of the feed water system, the, the condensate return and the makeup water comes inside. Um, you've got a deaerator and you've got um, feed pumps here and then circulation pumps around the sides and that's the boiler. Things to note in this picture, it is a beautiful clean plant, right? You literally could eat your dinner off the floor. Um, amazing what happens when you don't have to deal with ash and dust and fuel and things like that. So they're very quiet, very warm, um, very clean facilities um, and basically you can run in, in an automatic manner, very low. Um, staffing requirements. It's just a, a screen grab of the of the control screen. They're all fully automated. Um, you know that this particular plant just cuts in automatically based on steam demand and things like that. This is the, another facility, open country further down the South Island. And again, as you can see, you know, there's the there's the boiler there, and there's the, the feed water, the aerator system there and in a you know, very tidy, very clean looking package. Actually got an RO plant, an iron exchange plant, so it's actually contained in the water treatment plant building as well. Um, this is an example of a, of, a, of a unit from Denmark. These are large 40 megawatt units that provide district heating. Um, it's in a facility here and, and it's the, um, the, the, the hot water systems extracting out of there and the way they go. So that's providing you know, district heating to, to various areas in the, in the city um, when the electricity prices are very low. So what's the advantages? Extremely fast response times and fast startup times. Okay, so you know they, they, they're very quick, very very fast to come up and down and load. Very small thermal mass. Um, they've actually got 
not, not a lot of water actually in them, so very low thermal stresses, very small plant footprint, um, no fuel or waste handling systems, you know, and obviously they're green if your electricity supply is renewable. Um, and, and they're highly automated, limited attendance, remote control, and you can't have boiler tube failures because you don't have boiler tubes. So much less sort of issues with, with corrosion. Um, the, the feed water system and the boiler itself is, is mostly made out of carbon steel. So you still have to be aware of carbon steel type corrosion issues, but you don't have to worry about you know, more the sort of normal um, sort of, you know, you're not getting under deposit corrosion or, you know, any kind of sort of corrosion fatigue type issues or anything like that yet. Uh, but probably shouldn't have them. What's the disadvantages? Well, high fuel costs. So, you know, it's it's whatever the cost of electricity is that, that directly relates to the cost of your steam. Um, the other thing is when you're displacing industrial boilers, these plants do need high purity makeup water. They can't really run off a softened water plant and that you get for a lot of these, you know, the call of a 10 bar industrial boiler probably doesn't have a demon plant, probably runs off softened water. Um, so you need an iron exchange or an ROC EDI plant. Um, you've got to consider high voltage electricity, um, make sure that that system is, that part of the system is designed and safe. Um, you obviously need high voltage supply to a site. If you've got a remote facility that you're a long way off your, off your main distribution grid, you may have supply and stability issues. Um, you know, it's, it's black box technology in a lot of ways and, and sites that are used to, you know, coal boilers or gas boilers have a lot of new learnings to get through and get your heads around. And, and one thing here is your, your water chemistry control is, is, is a little bit different. Um, you know, when we're talking about um, electrolyte chemistry rather than normal boiler chemistry because the water is actually part of the circuit. And we find that because there's no guidelines or standards, there's not a lot of vendor um, experience or understanding, um, things get lost in translation sometimes and, and it makes it a little bit hard. And the other thing is very small water volumes. So, you know, some of your traditional chemical strengths for dosing for things like ammonia or, or phosphate, um, you have to use quite dilute chemicals because, you know, using more concentrated chemicals gives you, gives you um, dosing control issues. And then there's this other thing here. There is a risk of electrical arcing, you know, and this can cause electrode damage and material damage, and, and we can get um, gas breakdown reactions. So in the units that are nitrogen capped, we get decomposition of the nitrogen and form things like nitric acids and stuff like that, which isn't very good. And then in the steam units, we get um, breakdown and we can get oxygen and, and hydrogen formation going on. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So, you know, some of the problems we've seen, obviously it's, it's a conflict between what we call electrolyte chemistry and, and, and sort of the corrosion and, and steam process chemistry. Um, and, and what we find is, you know, you, you, these plants require specific conductivities for the, for the, for the, for the current. For the, for the, you know, for the, allow the current to flow through um, at a right, at, at the right rates so to get the right efficiency. So if you, you have to think about what you're dosing, what it does to the conductivity. Um, and what we find is traditional chemicals like phosphate and caustic, they have a fixed relationship between um, conductivity and pH. So if you have a, a, a conflict between you want a certain conductivity and a certain pH, that might not actually be achievable. Um, also, you've got to consider where does that, that steam go, what's the host, and what purity requirements they need. And, and sometimes we find that the vendor requirements are impossible to meet without a little bit of discussion and, and working through those. Some of the plants around the place, we've seen issues where basically water-soluble material has been put into them. Um, and some of, the, some of the plants overseas have had you know, glass reinforced plastic added and illuminate silicates and then they're wondering why they get very high silica levels in the boiler and, and organic contamination and it's coming from materials that shouldn't have been in there that actually dissolve at the operating temperatures and pressures. Um, and then the other one is electrical arcing inside reactions. So if we get an electrical arc inside these things in a steam boiler, we get uncontrolled electrolysis um, and we get basically hydrogen oxygen radicals, we get hydrogen peroxide and hydrogen gas and oxygen formed, um, which isn't, isn't very good. Um, in the hot water boilers with nitrogen capping, we get nitrogen breakdown and basically you get nitrogen radical formation, end up with nitric acid and actually drops the boiler pH um, quite significantly. And, and you get increased corrosion because you're now operating in an acidic um, environment. And we see degradation and failure of electrodes. Um, and then there's also something that's been raised that we haven't managed to kind of get any confirmation on yet, but like obviously anyone that sort of knows anything about cathodic protection or anodic protection, 
will suddenly go, well, you've got all this current flowing if you haven't got your earthing setups right and your, things like that. If we've got stray currents, are we actually setting up or do we have the potential to set up electrochemical kind of reactions um, in the plant? And, and that may be what happens in some plants and there's still a bit of work going on around that. Um, you know, just don't need to worry about this too much, but this was just a little example here where um, the boiler had initially a conductivity target of 25 microsiemens per centimetre, um, which equates about 5 ppm of trisodium phosphate, could only, was specified only to use TSP, but the boiler pH target was specified at 9.3. So anyone that's worked with phosphate would know at 5 ppm TSP, you ain't going to be pH 9.3. Um, you know, you there's lots of these curves out here that, that show us, you know, if you go up to 5 ppm, this is this is sort of where your pH is going to be. Um, the chemical vendor um, at the time, that was, this was very new to them and new to the new to everyone, they were a bit confused. So we sort of had to go back to basics and kind of say, look, let's let's relook at this. What's the what's the primary thing that we're trying to do here? Get that conductivity right. Okay, you know, what what's the problem with the pH? Actually, there's no problem, so we can run at a higher pH, not necessarily a bad thing. You know, taking the current IEPS TGDs and, and kind of extracting out the right bits of information, we can come up with a revised program, get everybody in agreement with that, and um, get the boiler up and running, and, and everybody was pretty happy. Um, other things that we've seen is, you know, maybe, you know, the classic boiler setup tuning things, you know, blow down set point higher than the dosing set points, and the system's fighting each other. Normally, once you pick those things up, you can fix them pretty quickly. You know, so, you know, this is this is the inside of a, of a particular electrode boiler and, and these are parts of the electrodes coming down um, and this unit had overflow pipes made out of glass reinforced plastic in there and at those temperatures and pressures it was they were dissolving and, and failing and, and causing all kinds of problems um, and then there's the there's the pipes there that they shouldn't have they shouldn't have used when we get um, to arcing this is this is really interesting you know and this is this is um, this is basically same process as it happened in a nuclear reactor when you have a high energy field if you have water, and when you have electrical arcing going on, you get the same same equation as we get here. So instead of you could substitute radiation, um, this is out of the can do reactor handbook um, for for electrical arcing. We split the water molecules up. We get a bunch of electrons. We get H different versions of hyd oh, hydrogen ions, OH, HO2s, H2 and H2O2s, and then what we basically get are, at the temperatures in the boiler, the, the hydrogen peroxide will will start to basically decompose. Um, and you end up with a whole lot of oxygen and more water. Um, these will recombine back into water and, and into hydrogen, and we see elevated levels of hydrogen and, and, and oxygen in the steam, um, which is a pretty good indicator that there's something going on um, in the plant. You know, normally fossil plants maybe expect to see a few ppb of hydrogen in the steam, and oxygen should match whatever's coming through with the feed water. So. Here we are doing some testing on this plant and um, this plant here, this is in the steam and you see here we have 527 ppb of oxygen and, and 68 ppb of hydrogen. Um, you now this plant's got a deaerator on it and it's producing 5 ppb of, um, of oxygen in that deaerator. So, you know, we are generating significant amounts of, of unwanted byproducts because of, because of an arc reaction. So it's a good good application of, of um, some of these instruments in a, in a, in a way that they weren't, weren't um, Ballot for, and when you look at this data that you get out of this, you say, look, these these two processes are interrelated. The hydrogen and the oxygen all, all track together as we as we as we move around in the different loads. And as you see here, as the unit came up in load, we see this decreasing trend, and that's sort of telling us that there's a there's a problem, um, there's a base ground baseline problem in this unit. But as you go up in load, it gets more and more diluted as we increase the steam flow, and that that triggered off the process to identify what was going on. And, and here's just some examples of, of arcing damage. This is a, an electrode out of a unit here, and it's, it's basically suffered a failure and, and broken off in service and the boiler shut down. This is another electrode type here, and there's material loss here. Um, these are some studs that hold down an insulating panel on the bottom, and this has been a, basically there's been a lightning strike of the current through the water going onto these studs and, and vaporizing them. So you're, you're losing a bit of energy from the system. Um, you're generating these unwanted gas products. In this particular plant here, we were initially quite concerned about the amount of hydrogen being present in the steam that we did a little investigation looking at risk of hydrogen embrittlement downstream, um, but we were below those those critical levels, so that was that was a relief. Um, and the site just is aware that you know, there is potential for a little bit of hydrogen build up in the system, and they've modified their, their shutdown and inspection protocols to take that into account. 
and in this particular plant here, it's a bit of a confusing graph, but you know, the problem was identified. So what we had here is at very low loads, we, we had a lot of hydrogen being formed. Um, there were some internal modifications done and, and basically we, we could drop those levels. And then as I came up and load, we went from around 50 PPB at, at two, two megawatt operation down to around 15 to 18 and then even lower at full load. And that was pretty conclusive that the problem was fixed. And we considered this sort of, this sort of range here to be what, what you should expect for baselines in those units. So very different plants to, to conventional fossil biomass plants, but you know, whenever you look at these new things, science rules always apply. Um, you know, so you go back to your first principles and say what what is happening here, what's what's going on, try and understand the process, and normally you can you can work it out. Um, but there are no current guidelines and there's almost zero published literature on these on these plants and, and case studies or, or problems or solutions with them, even though they've been around for quite a long time. Some of the Scandinavian suppliers, you know, it's sort of 50 plus years that various versions of these boilers are out there, but, you know, there's not, not a lot of literature. Um, big take up in New Zealand um, as part of decarbonisation, you know, probably coming to industrial sites in Australia in the future. You know, and, and they have a lot of advantages, you know, a lot of advantages, you know, very, very good for industrial kind of steam use. Um, there's always issues around water chemistry, you know, but, you know, you can resolve these with good chemistry monitoring and, and actually having an application for steam hydrogen testing, which is, which is good. Um, you know, and, and your water steam chemistry needs to, you know, take into account steam water, feed water, boiler corrosion and electrolyte chemistry, which is a bit of a head shift, you know, not just dealing with normal purities and um and normal boiler chemistry issues we're actually now thinking that we're part of the electrical circuit it's electrolyte chemistry and and there's work towards um an iops guideline for this for this area and just like to acknowledge um iops and nzaps and siaps for for the information sharing um Sinlay, an open country for sharing allowing us to share some information and data from their plants and these are the, the the suppliers of electro boilers in New Zealand along the bottom, Alpan Technic in Windsor, um, Parat, and Energy Plant Solutions, who um, is kindly one of the sponsors of AB Hub. So yeah, thank you. And any questions? Yeah. Nice, David. Thank you. I have one. I have one quick question before we move to Barry. Um, what? What is the what voltage is this high voltage what kind of range we're talking about? Oh, um, you got me on the spot here. It's it's high voltage, but I'd have to I'd KV. have to look that one up. It, yeah, eleven kV. There you go. Thank you, Anita. <laughs> <laughs> eleven kV. You said. Yeah, that's eleven right. kV. Eleven kV here. Yeah. Oh, that's moderate voltage. <laughs> I guess it's high if you're putting it in water, though. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, just on that, what is the um, uh, current that you're running through the electrodes to make uh, the chemical reaction happen? That's another good question, Anita. Do you know? just getting my mute button working again. Um, I, I don't know a huge amount about it. Um, I think the, um, the the trip point for, you know, max MCR is around 350 amps from memory. So um, basically, you know, it, it runs down to a very low um, turn down limit. Um, I'm not 100% sure on that e EPS example that was given there, um, what the final threshold for, for low operation is, but um, looking at some other examples that we've been looking at recently, um, you know, we're talking about turn down down to about 4% MCR. Not quite answering your question, but hopefully this that can be correlated. The electrical stuff scares me, so I tend to stick to the chemistry stuff. So, but I should have probably preempted those kinds of questions and had the note. I've got them in my file. Yeah, we've got, we know what they are, but can't remember them off the top of my head. Yeah, David, it's, it, it's very similar to generating an electrostatic field, and I imagine that you, you, you know, you that's what you, you you'll be generating there at the, at those voltage and amps. So s similar to what we can do in the back end of a of a of a steam turbine. Yeah. So, so David, one, is one thing I'm 
Is this going to become so popular that we need to change the name again to AB Hub E? Quite well, definitely in New Zealand, um, in terms of industrial boilers, you know, it's it's you know that yeah, you know, there's always going to be a requirement for steam for industrial processes, and you know, in New Zealand, it's it's going to be biomass boilers, um, electrode boilers, and in certain locations, there's industrial geothermal steam use as well. But that that's obviously very geographically limited, um, you know. So all, all I can say is probably by the time we talk next year, we'll be saying like there's there's you know two or three more projects either built or or under construction, and that that number's just going to keep increasing every year um, as they displace the la actually quite large number of small, um, very old and and very dirty little coal boilers that are that are around the place. Good. Well, thank you. Very nice. Barry, um, would you like to introduce yourself and uh, yeah. put your slides up? Yeah, I can do as soon as Scott lets me. Um, here and uh, here. So that should be okay, Scott. Bob, that's okay, right? Yeah, looks perfect. Okay, so yeah, usually, um, uh, usually at the at the app hug uh, and a hug meetings, I usually provide uh, two presentations uh, to update what's happening on the chemistry, uh, what's happening internationally uh, mm -hmm. from the other meetings that Bob and I uh, manage. And uh, and what's happening on the IAPS uh, on the IAPS activities? Well, David did a little bit on the IAPS, so thank you. And but because of this um, virtual uh, meeting that we have this time, um, we had we had to reduce the number of presentations. So I'm going to try and do um, all of these things in in this one in this one presentation. So give you a little bit on the latest uh, international statistics, um, which which I. Try to show each year, and then tell you um, the latest um, uh, the, uh, what availability from uh, from IAPS, and then as I mentioned to John and Matt, uh, talk a little bit about the uh, the, the film forming substances. So um, as we um, as we work and uh, travel around the world, um, we continue to see uh, these uh, psychochemistry influence damage in fossil and combined cycle plants with the with the major ones the major one continuing to be uh, tube failures uh, this is the number one problem in both in both types of plant um, and the major failure mechanisms we already talked about some of them flow accelerated corrosion under deposit corrosion and corrosion fatigue uh, we still have quite a, quite a number of problems relating to the corrosion product transport as uh, John and Matt uh, in, indicated, and, uh, and and this leads to a number of problems. And then there are still uh, steam turbine uh, damage and failure taking place in the phase transition zone. And uh, since uh, I, uh, uh, since about 2008, when we introduced the, um, the 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 topic of repeat psychochemistry situations, it's now uh, uh, very well. Um, uh, solidified that all of these uh, failures relate to plants having multiples of these uh, of these repeat uh, situations. And um, if anybody in the audience wants to see any of the data, you can look at these references at the bottom. And for the HRSGs, particularly the one that Bob and I did just uh, a, a couple of years ago, and, and that explains explains them all. So the latest statistics are included in this um, in, in, in this uh, um, slide here. These are the um, uh, the red column are the repeat psychochemistry situations. There's nine of them, and uh, the blue column represents the data from uh, 145 fossil plants, and the green represents the data from 107 combined cycle HRSG plants. And um, these are the 
these are the categories. So uh, I don't have time to go through each of, each of them, but you can see easily um, which are the most important ones. Um, and that means uh, which are the ones that are not applied uh, properly in, in the plants and can result in those, uh, those failures that we just talked about. So corrosion products is the number one, is the number one uh, uh, repeat uh, situation in both types of plants. So this would be plants not meeting achievable levels or using the wrong processes to measure corrosion products. And uh, the second, one, the second, and the third ones would be down here at the bottom. Uh, online instrumentation not not meeting the uh, instrumentation that's required uh, for uh, for each one of these plants, and not challenging the status quo would be another one that's um, where where plants continue to use uh, older guideline older guideline values. And you can see you can see the other one. The other ones uh, right here, I've, I've talked about them with many of the last meetings. And um, the, there is a little bit of good news here, as you can see that over the last five years, it seems that uh, the situation is improving in the, in the combined cycle plants with these, down, with these downward uh, arrows. So this is a, a little bit about the, about the statistics now. What I want to do is just take you through some of the latest um, IAPS uh, information, and uh, David's already mentioned uh, the New Zealand committee here on the lower right, and there's a and there's an Australian uh, IAPS committee as well, and so you can any, anybody can contact uh, um, Hayden Henderson or or David, and uh, and acquire this information. So this is um, the new uh, uh, products that have been produced uh, since. Um, since uh, the last advert that we had in two in two nineteen, um, and just very quickly, there's a new guidance document for generators, states data water cooling systems. There's two film forming substance substance documents, a new one for industrial plants, and a revision of the one for fossil and combined cycle and biomass plants. And uh, and then there's quite an exciting development here on corrosion products. In flexible cycling and fast star plants, as Matt and John indicated, and there's a white paper, and I'll provide you some in, in, information on that. Of course, there's always been a um, uh, for the, at least for the last ten years, there's be there's been a feed water corrosion product or corrosion product uh, a technical guidance document. Uh, it's given by this number, which explains how to how to sample, how to analyze. And what's required from an optimum point of view, there is also a, um, a, a table of achievable total iron levels uh, that I've shown a number of times uh, what the achievable level should be with the different chemistries for feed water and in the drums of combined cycle plants, which are of interest here. And if there's any of you with air cool condensers out there, then you, you can see you can see that as well. But it was recognized, uh, it was recognized uh, uh, by, uh, by many people and many plants uh, to the situation need to change from that, uh, from that guidance document for these flexible cycling and fast door plants. And it needed to be addressed. And so IAPS has been developing a, uh, a white paper, which, which just means a, a pre-technical guidance document that's, that's available to be to be used and and uh, and for the basis of a of a technical guidance document, we've conducted uh, some plant monitoring in in these uh, in these countries, and it's been subjected to a statistical analysis, and it, and this will be continued in 2022. So this is the good opportunity that I mentioned to to John and Matt, uh, and the first version of of the of an IAPS decay. A decay map for corrosion products. I'll show. I'll show you that has been developed, and uh, this white paper is available to any to anybody, uh, and you can contact me or David or Hend Hayden or or um, we uh, we'll provide it. Uh, we'll provide it for you. And the um, the concept of uh, the concept of this is pretty much as I described uh, just before. 
is that when you have these uh, frequently frequently operated units, flexible flexible plan fast start units, then each time you start up, you get a very high level of corrosion products, and these corrosion products decay um, over time, depending upon what the operation or the shutdown or the startup chemistry was. And uh, very simply, uh, if you take uh, follow this follow this arrow here. Uh, uh, this would involve improved uh, improving the operation, um, improving shutdown and startup chemistry, so that that decay time takes uh, is much less. And uh, if it's much less, it means that much much lower levels of corrosion products are being transported. And uh, so this was the concept, and we tr we translated this into uh, this uh, corrosion map. So you can see that for iron up the left hand side and copper up the right hand side and time along the bottom, we translated this into like a green, yellow, and red. And so if your if your corrosion product profile um, comes in the green area, that would mean that um, it was op it was an optimum operation shutdown or startup. If it was in the red, it would be a relatively poor. Uh, a startup shutdown or 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 operation, and uh, so the uh, the process uh, that's described in the white paper uses proxy methods to um, to identify the co the corrosion products. You would you would develop a calibration curve like this, where you might have uh, the amount of iron up the vertical axis and, and turbidity. If that's what you're using along this axis, and then translate this into a profile, which is shown by this blue the blue curve here, and uh, then you can put this blue curve onto onto the decay map, which is shown which is shown here, and this is for what what was it, or was considered as a as a well operated optimum chemistry HRSG. In in uh, in Denmark, and you can see here's that here's that profile put across the bottom here in the green area. So that's that's good. But if it was in the red profile, you, you could change the uh, startup or shutdown conditions, and hopefully move in the direction of that arrow that I showed you before to make make that improvement on the um, on on the startup. But most importantly, to reduce the amount of iron that's transported. In, into the HRSG or into the boiler. So this is a very exciting development. We're, we're uh, interested in getting uh, some more plants involved. So if any of you are interested, uh, Matt and, uh, and uh, John seem to be an ideal case. And, uh, and w we would then be able to expand the database so, so that the process becomes, uh, becomes uh, better. Okay, so now I want to move on to the latest on film forming substances. Um, I IAPS is uh, heavily involved in in this in this activity, and um, I put this I put this slide in. Uh, I, I did mention to uh, to Matt. Uh, so these are film forming substances here, oh, and, yeah, sure. and there was yeah, a lot of there was a lot of. Uh, hello. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Uh, the, the, there was a lot of uh, misunderstanding of what the terminology was, so we use this. Uh, uh, these FFA and FF uh, are the amine-based uh, film-forming substances, and uh, FFP are the are the film-forming products. And uh, you can see the active ingredient here for the film-forming amines: um, ODA, OLA, and ALDA. And the film-forming products are proprietary. Uh, compounds, uh, secret uh, recipes, uh, and but but this is the this is the terminology. So if if we use a FFP, then we know that it's in this category, or if it's in FFA, then we know it's in in this category. And part of the part of the problem here is that there is such a wide range of these products um, on the market, and uh, David and I put together uh, 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 a presentation that was. Given at the IAP symposium in September, and uh, and this just is just meant to show the wide range of products and mixtures. You have the products across the top here, and so you have the film forming products, the non-amine based, and then the and then 
just three examples of, of, of FFA here with different stabilizations and uh, 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 the, the applications are pretty much the same in fossil or industrial or, or nuclear. Nu nuclear is really in this category using ODA. Uh, this is the description of, of those uh, compounds, the concentration. And most importantly, from IAPS's point of view, uh, is, is, the, um, is the limited understanding um, of, uh, of these uh, film forming uh, amine compounds, with the exception, I would say, of ODA, and, um, and, and very limited understanding for the film forming products over here. And not, not only um, is there a wide range of these, uh, of these uh, chemicals, there are also a wide range of suppliers, uh, and, at, and at the uh, from the IAPS uh, conferences that we've that we've run, we find that there's uh, at least ten of these suppliers ar ar around the world. So it becomes very difficult for organisations um, to provide guidance uh, to, to provide guidance documents. But and so we have to do we have to do this in a different way. And so I thought I would just share. A few key points with you uh, from the from the conferences that we've uh, that, that that we've run. Uh, probably a number of you will know that IAPS has organised four film forming substance conferences, and from these we can make some general uh, uh, statements, uh, both in the scientific area, in the research area, and in the application area. So first of all, in the in the in in, in here we have uh, applications have been have uh, been in all the different plants in fossil combined cycle HRSGs industrial plants all different types with and without air cool condensers um, and and industrial plants. It's there are lots of examples of of, of successful operation and shutdown and preservation. Um, in the in the research areas, uh, thermal decomposition or thermolysis has been looked at uh, mainly mainly for ODA, a little bit for for the other o, uh, amine older, and we know what temperatures they can can go to without degrading. Uh, the film formation has been looked at in terms of the hyd hydrophobicity level visually, uh, and in laboratory using X-ray. Uh, photoelectron spectroscopy (XPS) and and EIS electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. We, uh, there's been some work on absorption of these products uh, onto metal surfaces, and a very interesting piece of work was presented at the last uh, at the last conference uh, from from the workers in in uh, France. Uh, most of this research is done in in Europe. And uh, and the in situ formation in terms of the thickness and the porosity, uh, looking at the effectiveness of these uh, nanometer films, they're very very thin nanometer, and looking at the porosity in them. And again, most of the early work has been done on ODA. It needs to be done on some of the other, on some of the other uh, uh, compounds that I mentioned as well. And probably of more interest to this group is the as the application side. And so what we see is whenever there is a whenever there is a been a presentation at one of the conferences, um, we find universal reduction in feed water, iron and copper transport, but no equivalent understanding of what's happening to the actual growth mechanism of the oxides themselves. N not none. We have not seen we have not seen any equivalent understanding for oxide growth reductions in condensate and feed water, yet we see in all these presentations universal reduction in the transport. There's general observation of hydrophobic films on water touch surfaces, but it's under, it, it must be underlined here that the hyd hydrophobicity by itself does not prove the presence of the film or any protection. And we still are struggling with uh, film formation remains very questionable on steam touch surfaces, and uh, and then there's a little bit of of a variation, variable documentation of corrosion and FAC um, in in uh, in single phase locations, but also in two phase locations, and uh, particularly uh, uh, air cooled uh, condensers are a good example 
and that's shown on this next slide. We just we just presented this at the air cooled uh, condenser users group and um, last about a month ago. So this is a good example here for an uh, so this is in the upper duct and these are the tube entries um, in 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 the upper duct and uh, the white areas indicate uh, uh, corrosion and FAC and the more white areas the worse it is. There's an index. Uh, it's called the DC index, and the higher the number, the worse it is. So this is five is the highest. So this is a, a very serious situation. Um, so this is a unit with 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 uh, relatively low pH uh, and 9.1 or 9.2, and uh, no film forming substance. And the iron levels here in the condensate would be in the hundreds. And so uh, this just shows a, an, an application using a film forming substance. Um, and you can see that most of the white areas have disappeared and even these on the cross members have disappeared as well. So this is a good example. And you can see the actual in the in index itself, the DC index now comes down to the lowest level. So this is uh, a, a good uh, example, but not very well documented is the point. We want these to be documented so that we can so that we can validate them. So in summary for FFS applications, um, this is just some overall thoughts. Um, I think uh, again this is taken from the from the presentation that uh, uh, David Allison and I made at the at, at the IAPS meeting in September. Basic understanding has improved worldwide since 2016, but there's still problems occurring in plants worldwide. But unfortunately, these are not openly openly published. Uh, we have access to them because we ask to do assessments in plants or to review situations with film forming substances. And some of the problems, I'll show you a couple of examples or internal deposits, tube failures, uh, uh, tube failures, especially under deposit corrosion is quite a common one. And the formation of gunk or gel like deposits on heat transfer surfaces. And here's a couple of examples. So the first example is in um, the HP evaporator of a double pressure HRSG. And you can see the internal surfaces are, are very uh, heavily deposited. There was, a, there was a failure right here in this yellow circle. And, and, uh, and so when we look at this in detail, now uh, you can see here on the left hand side, very heavy deposits. And on the right hand side, when we do the metallography, we find this laminated, uh, the laminated structure. Uh, and the under deposit, uh, typical of under deposit corrosion uh, mechanism. The second example is uh, shown is shown here, where the black areas are are. Uh, so this is again another triple pressure HRSG uh, that had gunk formation in the LP drum. You can see some of it here in the person's hand. Uh, and although we get uh, some hydrophobicity, as you can see from these little these little bubbles. Right here, there was this uh, formation of this gunk or gel like material. Very difficult, very difficult to analyze. Um, and we're still, we're still working on this. So this is a couple of examples that we, that, that, that we have. And all, all of these, <coughs> all of these aspects, the, these two examples relate to the oxides that form on these surfaces and, and how that formation of the oxides might change when a film forming substance is added. And, uh, and so we took a big uh, a, a look at this in, in, in the uh, film forming substance conference. Uh, myself and Derek Lister and Jörg Fandrich, who's the leading person in, in the world in, on, in nuclear uh, FFS. And uh, we looked at all the oxides that grow all around the cycle. Unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about them all today, but I thought I'd just tell you the sort of things that we're doing in, in IAPS. And this is in for the feed water, the condensate and feed water, where the temperature of interest is in is in this range, up to maybe maybe 300, 300 degrees. We understand uh, very, very well how the oxides grow in this part of the plant. So you have a bit of carbon steel here, the blue, this little blue area. 
and you have the fluid, the, the feed water or the condensate flowing past. And in between here, you get this, you get this oxide forming. It forms at the metal oxide interface here through a two part process. First of all, forming uh, a, a hydroxide and, uh, and then being removed from the surface here as a soluble product or as a particle, a particle. And of course, that's that process is increased when the flow is when the flow is increased. And we understand uh, we understand the growth and and how it releases particulates and soluble product, and the, how the turbulence increases it. It's very well understood. But what is not understood is is when you form this nano layer of uh, film forming substance on the surface. Uh, we don't exactly know uh, what it's done. And what what happens? Um, do, do, does it reduce the liquid on the surface? Most probably. And does that reduction uh, re reduce the amount of oxidizing power to the surface, or does it change the actual formation of the of the hydroxide itself? Where I I I, I is looking at um, is going to look at this and develop uh, the research needs for it this year, uh, hopefully this year or early next year. But it's the same sort of thing for the boiler and for the steam circuits. And so, in, in, in summary, um, we have uh, a number of very well established and understood chemistries for a long period of time that are the established uh, chemistries that most plants around the world uh, operate to. But as I've shown you, we have these repeat psychochemistry situations, they exist. Uh, related to the very basics of power plant chemistry. And uh, so it becomes very important when you start to add a film forming substance that you take the same careful approach, the same, apply the same simple rules uh, and conduct a comprehensive monitoring program, pretty much a, a, as John and uh, Matt uh, outlined in the first in the first publication today. Very important that that's done. If this isn't done, when you apply a film forming substance, then you then there's a possibility that you'll end up with the problem, some of the problems like I showed. So, um, I just wanted to finish here with a couple of bookmarks for for anybody. The next uh, film forming substance conference will be in March next year. If you have any suggestions or any of you that are using film forming substances or would like to take part provide a suggestion to uh, David Addison or myself, and we have the, uh, the equivalent uh, meeting to this one in Europe, uh, the European HRSG Forum, uh, that'll take place in May. And uh, if there are any suggestions, then please provide suggestions to myself or to, or, or to Bob. And that's where I'm going to finish, uh, uh, Bob. Uh, we're going to have this presentation available for everybody, and there's three or four slides here with 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 a list of all the uh, technical guidance documents for um, for from 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 my apps. Oh, so sure. that's where I'll I'll finish. I think. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, we next have uh, two more sponsor presentations. Um, and then oh, Bob, we have some questions first, eh? Oh, uh, well, I was going to do this after, but yeah. Well, we don't have any questions for you that I see. Oh, okay, good. Uh, so um, we do have one for uh, for David. For David, no, no, never mind. We don't. It's a general question, so we'll pick it up after. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to find my copy of the agenda here. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Rodman from Echo Lab, can you uh, share your screen, introduce yourself, and uh, tell us about Echo Lab? Yep. Uh, looks like somebody needs to give me the ability to share. Yeah, Scott will be right on that. Okay, cool. Yeah, so thanks everybody for the opportunity to give a bit of an uh, overview of the Ecolab team or Ecolab business. Um, many of you would have known us for many years as Nelco and then Nelco Water. 
the Nalco water main is still persistent, but Ecolab, like many big companies, is restructuring uh, constantly and have now formed um, or pulled a bunch of businesses uh, together under one banner called the Ecolab Industrial Group. So I'm just going to quickly get that to advance. <clears throat> So Ecolab as a business, um, so our parent company, have a fairly bold purpose. Uh, we partner to make the world cleaner, safer and healthier. So helping customers succeed while protecting people and vital resources. So that's a pretty broad uh, purpose and that really represents our company uh, as, a, as a whole. It's a very large business, uh, nearly 3 million customers. Um, a lot of technology centers, so this is where R&D people are housed, um, manufacturing, a lot of patents. Um, so we're very active in the R&D space. And as you can see, with over 1,200 R&D scientists. Um, so what does the global industrial group look like? Uh, so there's, as you can see here, a lot of pillars. So the business is realigning to, to have global uh, focused businesses in each of these areas. Uh, and you can see power is, is one of those global pillars. And I've got a slide on that. Um, but this is just our industrial group. Um, this does not in, include our healthcare um, and some other businesses. So industrial group, um, the way we work and the way we're, we're I guess, transforming the way we deal with our customers. Everybody would have known us over the years for looking at all parts of uh, water treatment, um, you know, whether that be pre-treatment, boilers, uh, process applications, cooling, as well as post-treatment, so that's wastewater, et cetera. Um, we, say, we have the same mantra that we've always had, which is to reduce, reuse, recycle water. Um, and we've added some in there, ensure hygiene and food safety. So again, this is in the industrial group. Ultimately though, we're looking to maximize the profitability of our customers. And we do that using a combination of on-site expertise, connected chemistries, digital technologies, and predictive and prescriptive analytics. So again, our core capabilities, personalized service, uh, training, data-driven insights, chemistry and dispensing. So our digital expertise, over the last five years, Ecolab has invested uh, a very large sum of money into developing our digital presence. Um, we're developing innovative technologies and we're continually um, enhancing and expanding our digital portfolio. One of the first digital offerings that we produced actually is our ability to monitor uh, condenser performance. Uh, we actually connect to customers um, systems and, and recover data online uh, in real time and do condenser performance analyses. And we actually have predictive models now that, that take in a range of parameters, including the plant operating parameters, but also weather um, and information from our own sensors uh, that we might have deployed on your site. And we can use all of that information now to predict uh, whether there are going to be performance issues with your condenser, uh, if there are things that we can optimize and improve uh, the operation. So that's quite an exciting field. And as I said, we're expanding our digital offerings to include other forms of heat exchanger, performance monitoring, as well as um, water flow uh, monitoring and yeah, there's a whole bunch of uh, things that we are doing. In the power space, where do we play? Well, we play across, as you can see there, we're notionally aligned into coal, natural gas, nuclear, and geothermal. Um, our value proposition around this is to help our customers reliably um, perform at a high level using the least amount of water and energy um, and at the lowest cost. Obviously, as customers, as power customers, you want to put out more fuel for less fuel. And currently we, we are, I guess, involved with 22% of the world's power production. So as mentioned, we 
have really uh, focused in on our ability to provide uh, this digital, new digital platforms. We've developed our 3D tracer technology, which is using uh, our proprietary sensors uh, and chemistries to collect data from uh, various uh, operating systems. Um, that data is then collected into our cloud. We have uh, our system, insurance, system assurance center, uh, which are a team of experts based in uh, Pune, India. We have roughly 150 uh, fully qualified engineers that are constantly monitoring and, uh, and watching over all of these systems. Um, and now we've developed what we call Ecolab 3D, which is a cloud, industrial cloud platform that's allowing us to pull together not only the data from our own sensors, but from our limb systems, from customers, from uh, manually entered data. And we can now pool all of this information to give us a much, um, uh, much more visibility into the operation, into our customers' operations. And that will in turn drive um, our ability to carry out predictive analytics to actually help customers identify when things are going wrong at a much earlier point and hopefully avoid uh, issues in the future. So as I said, um, quite an exciting space and being developed um, as we speak, um, continuously being worked on. So something else that uh, I guess I mentioned at the start, we are global and growing um, and we're very proud to announce and many of you would have seen this already, uh, that we are going to acquire the Purolite uh, resin manufacturing business. Um, this is seen as a strategic investment, uh, and there's a lot of synergies between uh, the Purolite business and the Ecolab business. So Purolite uh, have developed technologies uh, that are going to play a very big part in the, in the medical space. Uh, for purifying things like monoclonal antibodies. So there's a very strong linkage into our health sector uh, businesses or life sciences businesses. But also, as you guys would be aware, Purolite supply a lot of resin for um, iron exchange for water purification. And so there's going to be a strong uh, tie-in between the Purolite business and, and the Ecolab industrial business. And I'd just like to acknowledge there that um, this, the statement at the bottom, it was sent out as, as our email before the uh, conference started, but the decision was taken by the Brody family, um, you know, who own Purolite, because they believe that the business model they see within Ecolab really reflects how their business model has developed over the many years. Um, and so they see a lot of good synergies. With that, um, Probably the only other thing I would like to state is that uh, Ecolab, of course, has a film forming substance. And as Barry pointed out, we have film forming substances and film forming amines. Um, and yes, we are all still uh, learning about some of the uh, attributes of these products. Um, and needless to say, Ecolab is investing further into this field as we see it as a, a very uh, strong area for development and growth. I think that's all I really wanted to say, Barry. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. That's um, very that's very good. Um, and we and we and in IAPS we were very interested in their continuing to be part. Nelco Nelco then was part of the uh, the FFS original development. Okay. Next uh, we have Paul McPhee. With HRL, Paul, can you uh, Thanks very much. sharing, introduce yourself, and give us a few words? Sure. So um, hopefully you can see that. Yep. Yep. Looks perfect. Great. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to the uh, to the event. Um, HR wishes to thank the organisers for the opportunity to both sponsor this important event. And for those that don't know our company, introduce you to HRL Technology Group. HRL has a 60 year heritage in quality assurance services, fine tuning industrial plant, optimising operational performance, 
and extending the life of valuable assets. We are the region's leading engineering and scientific services consultancy, and our clients see us quite rightly as the local experts in HRSG, boilers, piping and turbines. Our vision centers around our specialist testing capabilities and innovative solutions to enhance the operating environment and performance of our clients' assets. Our mission is to provide expertise, support, and technical options to our customers to, ena to enable transition to a commercially and environmentally sustainable future. To do that, we prioritize safety, responsiveness, and a passion to get results and add value for clients. Understandably, HRL is a data-driven service provider. Our expert and advisory consultancy aims to be holistic to ensure superior data extraction techniques, interpretation, and optimal solution provision. Our services include process and environmental services covering process reliability, efficiency, and optimization, including carbon reduction options and solutions. Engineering material services, covering optimizing inspection programs, plant life assessment, asset integrity, and plant management to reduce downtime, and the, and the full suite of laboratory testing and analysis services. In combination, HRL services provide clients with a total technical and consulting service with capability to address the most complex technical issues. Understanding all factors impacting outcomes and deriving optimal solutions and providing recommendations. We have an unrivaled breadth of expertise through our three business streams. Here are some examples of services we provide from different stages of project life cycles. Services such as operational stability, reliability, improvement opportunities, baseline review, feasibility, modeling, risk-based in inspection, flexible operations, mechanical and metallurgical testing, optimizing inspection programs. And that's just to name a few. HRL is an active enabler of the journey towards net zero emissions through technology innovation, development and implementation of future fuel initiatives and converting waste to energy. Simultaneously, we are contributing to this audacious target by optimizing client plant performance, reducing fuel consumption, and reducing emissions. We would very much welcome the opportunity to discuss your current and future needs and propose a delivery plan of action for you. You'll meet several of our people over the next couple of days, I hope, um, and I'd welcome you to introduce yourself um, and have that discussion with them about what's keeping you awake at night and the solutions that we could provide. Thanks very much. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate Thank you. It. Okay, Barry, we have uh, a little less than a half hour left to uh, take some general questions or any follow-ups from the presentation. Yeah. So there was a there was a few there was a few here from um, from Lester. He, uh, he, it's quite okay for him to to uh, to verbalize them if uh, Scott can unmute him. Can you hear me? Yep, yeah. Nals, we can hear you and see you. All right, yeah, I turned my stuff on. Yeah, I'm curious. What's that, what's that um, black line? What's that black line around your lips? <laughs> That's not a tattoo. It's not a tattoo, <laughs> but but we can tell we can tell some stories about that later for sure. Uh, okay. Go yeah. ahead. So we're finding that, you know, as these HRSGs age, there's more and more potential for tight cracks. And if we can find those tight cracks early, you know, it'll help us, you know, avoid a forced outage. Uh, but keeping the unit full of water is an easy way to put a little bit of hydrostatic pressure head on economizers and evaporators and maybe even reheaters and superheaters that collect some condensate as things start to cool. But the, cons the uh, conflict is, you, you know, there's some advantages of flash drying where you can 
you know, uh, drain when, the, when there's some pressure and let the heat help drive out some of the moisture. I'd like to try to do both. I'd, I'd like the, the clients to keep water in the units, give me a chance to crawl through for a day and then drain the unit. But then I'm setting them up for some moisture left over for the rest of the outage. So what, you know, what, what can we, what can we do? You know, what film forming substances, air moving things and the steam drums after I get done, you know, ways to push that moisture out. So we get the benefits of both worlds. That's my question. Well, I, I'm, I'm serious about this answer, though you may not want to hear it. Um, way back in the old days, uh, on conventional boilers, we had some, uh, you know, call them air conditioned suits. So we could enter the boiler while it was still too hot for a normal entry. But in a, in a critical situation, this equipment allowed us to, uh, you know, to get in sooner. So I'm not, you know, I don't have any idea whether your personal preferences or the current health and safety regulations would permit something like that, or if this equipment's still available. Uh, but but you getting in there sooner or, or developing some means of doing the inspection remotely while the boiler is still hot and, and wet. Yeah. So now we gotta talk that... about, now we gotta talk about chemistry, Lester. Any other, any other? Did you have another one, Lester? Are you... Well, I thought, uh, you know, as you were talking, Barry, about film forming substances, and maybe there's potential there for to diminish the need for flash drying. Uh, if you, if you're, if we were confident, we're putting some sort of coating on the, on the steel, you know, so that we can, it can tolerate a bit of moisture or, or sheds it quickly. That'd be great. Um, you know, then I can then I can tell clients, hey, don't don't worry about that water there for the first couple of days of the outage. Yeah, yeah, there'll be some moisture left over, but I, I'll find more leaks if you've if you let me get in there. And a lot of times HSGs, the heat rises to the top, you know, so I can get in the bottom areas pretty quick and look up and see those wet marks and and you know, see the water on the floor and you know, some solid clues without having to go up high um, where it stays hot for another day or two. Yeah, Lester, I'm sure you, uh, I'm sure you, you, you might have understood, or maybe we didn't talk long enough about them. But there is a, there is a, a reasonably serious question about whether these provide any protection to the steam circuits. So you know, uh, they're they're basically water touched tubing, water touched pressure vessels. So the the the, the philosophy behind your question would work. Uh, probably for the for the water touch services, and there's lots of good experience out there of providing that protection, but not but not if you are interested in the same thing in the steam circuits. Can I just can I just jump in here, Barry? This is this is an area that I've been working on for some other things, and and there is another class of chemicals called vapor phase inhibitors that are. Sort of known and sort of unknown, very commonly used in the workshops um, for providing hydro test water um, protection. And they basically they they behave exactly the same as a film former, except they they form a film offline. So one of the things about the the film forming substances that Barry talked about is they require the unit to be operating to form the film. It requires some time and some temperature. Um, when the unit is operating on circulation. So what they call vapor phase inhibitors, they could be dosed into the plant or, or sprayed into the into the into the superheaters and the reheaters. And they provide a basically a temporary film um, for that for that period and they they will vaporize and, and distribute through the plant. Um, and there are products on the market. Then it's not very well known, very, very much more well known for um Construction and concrete and packaging type applications. So that that might be something something to consider and um, as an alternative. And some of these products are also can be used. You can inject them through the gas turbine blade wash system um, when the gas turbine's offline, um, and they provide basically films through the gas turbine, and then they'll do the gas side of the HRSG as well for shutdown. So you can you can actually and there's applications. 
uh, case studies out there where they can provide that extra bit of protection. So in that case, you could leave things wet, um, do your tests, do your inspections, and then dose these things in. And it doesn't matter if the plant's not fully drained down because they will distribute through the vapor phase. They will enter the water phase, and then if there's a air gap somewhere else, they'll actually come back out and, and disperse few according to the according to the literature, and provide you with some protection. So it's something that is a bit old and a bit new, but not not particularly kind of well understood yet. But David, around around ten or twelve years ago, there was a fair amount of discussion at. Uh, HRSG meetings about vapor phase inhibitors and their use uh, in that way. Um, some of the cautions and questions that came up was how do these things behave when you refill the boiler and put it in service? And I don't recall any any answers ever coming to those questions. Yeah. Yeah. So so I guess my my level of understanding of them has increased significantly because we've been having some some detail, a lot more dealings with some of the manufacturers. So they are, some of them are aiming based, some of them are carboxylate based. There is literally thousands of different compounds and it depends on the compound that you're using. But basically what will happen is they will water solubilize. Um, once you have start the unit up and there's, there's not the, what we call the equilibrium concentration. So there's no more left in the feed water, that film will just come off the surface, right? So that's the other thing about the film formers to, to get the film to form, you dose them into the water, and then you you have a concentration in the in the feed water that allows the film to form. And if you want that film to remain, you have to keep a concentration in the water. So if you stop dosing a filmer, that film will just come back come back off the film. Eventually, it, 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 it's, you've got to maintain an equilibrium situation. So when you've had a vapor phase inhibitor in the system, it should just disappear. Okay. Um, it will just just go out and disappear out with the blowdown, um, you know, and and then undergo thermal decomposition. But I think you have to be very careful about which one that you use, so that it is one of these products that will not decompose in a way that will cause you lots of grief. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. But but there's still not a lot of there's not a nowhere nowhere near the amount of study in power stations as say a product like ODA that's been very very well verified. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Lester. And uh, uh, Bob, I noticed there was a question from Jason Spencer to Matt. That I don't think we asked that before. No, we didn't uh, around the. Uh, 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 have you done any in inspections on your condenser? Matt, is Matt still here? You requested Matty's hands. Yeah, no, he's, he's, he's moved on. He's had to go. Oh, okay. Um, so have we done any inspections in our condenser? Yep, yep, we do. Quite regular. In B inspections and our C inspections, Barry, yep. But but you've not you've not used the bypass excessively uh, to be no, expecting no, troubles, no. right? We, we have, we have, well, only during commissioning periods and the like when when we're required to go on a bypass for a day or so after yeah. a major outage. But generally we don't um, use the bypass modes, mainly because of loss of efficiency and the likes and the cost of fuel and everything else that goes with that. It doesn't really weigh up yes. for us. Yeah. Yes. So there's a question. Uh, th thank you, uh, John. Uh, Evan, uh, Evan Corbett has a question. On, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, g'day, guys. Um, just quick on this is to you, Barry, and um, thanks for your prezzo. You've been referencing the 2019 white paper for the fast start cycling plans for a while now. I'm just wondering when is it going to be able to be essentially downloaded or reviewed? Because I can't find it on the iApps page. Yeah, it won't be. It, it's not on the IAPS page because it's not an official document. It's a work. It's a working document, and so there are a couple of there are a couple of um, uh, ways that you can get it. You can get it from in Australia. You can get it from Hayden Henderson. Um, you can, uh, and I thought that I had already given a copy to Mr. Grellman, uh, but may, maybe maybe not, or we can. Uh, 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 
uh, uh, post it on the line online here, or I can send it to you. But it's av it's available. Um, it, uh, I, I've been distributing it because uh, we want we want to acquire some uh, other hosts. And, and um, d uh, did you check that it wasn't at the plant, Evan? I would gladly love to get a hold of it, be a host. Um, I, uh, I, I didn't know that Jeff had it. Um, but if you can send it to me, I'd happily yeah, accept I'll it. Send it. It's no, pro it's no problem. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Barry, I see a couple of questions that we had came in during your presentation for David. Um, if, if we want oh. to take them. Um, what, what are they? Yun okay. Yun Tian um, asked David, "What is the relationship of voltage and steam flow?" Um, because you may have to ask Anita that, David. <laughs> um, my understanding is the voltage is is steady. It's the amps, basically. It's the it's the current that varies with as you go up and down and um. As you increase, yeah, obviously, as you as you're producing more steam, the boiler is using more energy. Um, mm -hmm. But my 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 limited electrical understanding is, I think the voltage stays stable, um, and it's just the amps that would change. Yeah, so that that goes to the next question, I think, from uh, Lyle Chapman: Is load controlled by water flow and current, or current by water depth? It's 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 the how much of the electrode surface is covered by the water. By That's the water. how the units yeah. can control their output. So right. it, they've got very fast response um, in that in that electrode basket. Um, you know, so that the level just goes up and down. So as as you wanting to produce more steam, the unit the unit increases that level, which covers more and more of the electrode, um, and then you've got more surface area for that for that current to flow. That, that's my understanding. Yeah, definitely see the direct relationship between at, at low load you're at your lowest basket level, and at high load you're at your highest basket level. Right. So, Barry, do you see any other questions? Uh, well, I I didn't see I didn't see those that you just read out. So I yeah, they have... were they were fairly farther up the list. Maybe they came before you took over. Uh, yeah, but, just. Uh, we can just see if there's anybody anybody has any general questions like we do because we got you know yeah. five minutes. Does anybody right. in the audience have any general questions that they came to the meeting wanting to talk about? Feel free to raise your hand. No. Okay. Well, I think um, Anita has her hand raised, so she can unmute herself. Oh, does she? Okay. Oh, yeah. I see the little hand there. <laughs> Do you? Hi, we don't get a lot of those. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a question um, with um, pendant superheaters. Uh, I have um, one site in particular that um, is really struggling with pitting of the superheater pendants, and despite many efforts to um, get them to implement a, a better preservation procedure, um, they are still struggling to to actually um, deal with the root cause. So um, I guess one question I have is: Does anybody have um, a successful um, UTT method or or similar that they've applied to identifying um, pitting damage to um, superheater bends? And the diameters that I'm talking about are um, fifty point eight. Um, and thicknesses ranging from about four to um, four point nine. For a, that's, Anita, that's for a conventional fossil plant, right? Yeah, coal-fired boiler now converted to a wood pellet firing. Yeah. Yeah. So it relatively small. I think it's what twenty uh, thirty thirty megawatts or something like that. Okay. And the and the and the question the question is for others to uh, are uh, has anybody used any uh, NDE techniques to identify the pitting? Is that the question? Yeah, that's that's correct. So what we're finding is that um, 
uh, I guess, just using conventional probes and um, and so on, we're unable to get the coverage that we need to really detect the the sorts of pits that are that are forming near the bottom of the pendants. Yeah. So um, I guess we're about to embark on a customized method, and I just wanted to know if anybody had had that any experience in this area with trying to to deal with that um, pendant pitting. Um, I know I know it's reactionary rather than dealing with the root cause, but I guess this this is the situation we're currently in. And are the pits of the pit the, the pits lead to failure, so they're they're deep or narrow or shallow. They're actually relatively shallow, um, but they are leading to failure. And um, with all the investigations so far, they, they're quite randomly distributed. Um, they're not always right at the bottom of the low point of, of the um, pendant. They might actually be slightly on the uphill side of the bend. Um, yes. But yeah, yeah. They, they do appear to be relatively shallow compared to the area of, of them. We don't have um, the you know fine pit that I thought we might might have experienced with with yeah. this configuration. So there, so the, uh, Anita, they're they're usually at the water line, you know, like um, wherever wherever the condensate remains in the tube, the worst location is typically at the at the water line, um, where 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 the condensate remains in the tube. Yeah, I I guess we're we're sort of seeing them all over the place. Um, and and that might be partly because it's not necessarily a slug of water. Sometimes it's just a bit of a puddle. Um, so so we don't necessarily have a, a slug of water where you've got got a tide line and such. And I guess there is a bit of history to to the superheater um, and in this plant configuration, um, they have had um, have had issues with um, dosed. Uh, spray water going into the system. They have had deaerator. Um, sorry, they've got carryover issues from the drum. The deaerator performance has been problematic, so they've had uh, sulfite dosing in in the deaerator, which obviously um, can get carried over into the superheater. Um, mm. So, so there are a few contaminants in there uh, also that that are contributing to the problem. Yeah. Well, I, don't I guess I, I, Anita, it's Douglas, Douglas Bell here. Yeah. Um, a, a quick um, comment on that. I'm not a NDT specialist myself, but we, um, our NDT specialists are working on EMAPs combined with TFM for pitting identification, um, as well as radiography. Obviously, can be can be used. Yeah, we've we've tried some radiography. That's actually been um, somewhat successful in like sort of understanding how much condensate formation we've got um, and identifying some areas of suspected pitting. But in terms of quantifying it, it's it's been been flawed. So so you're saying EMAT and TFM? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. You know, so Anita, what what method of radiography were you using? Just conventional radiography, or using a, a digital computed radiography method? It was just um, con conventional profile. Okay. Um, I've got to talk more a little bit more about digital radiography on Thursday, but um, that could be an option as well. Um, digital radiography has got a much better resolution now than it ever did, but it also has got the ability to find smaller pits and also measure them. So that might be an option for you. Yeah, one of, one of the issues we have is that the um, pitting is not always directly on the centre line of the bend. So, you know, it might be on the side of the tube a little bit. So um, I think in in maybe, you know, 20, 30 uh, shots that, that were done, uh, there's probably only one where we managed to pick up the cross section. Obviously with digital, yeah, you can go back and reshoot and, and you get that feedback straight straight away. So definitely there's some advantages there, but that, that's been the challenge we've got is just trying to get that that cross section um, at the right right angle. Yeah, and you don't necessarily need a cross section as long as you've got a comparator shim to measure the grayscale change. So that's a big option as well. Okay. Right. If there's no other questions about the NDT method, I just have a secondary question. Um, so what, one of the um, attempts they've made in lieu of being able to um, eliminate the condensate formation in the pendants 
is to actually swap over to um, nitrogen capping. Um, so I guess uh, with with that profile radiography that that I was just talking about, um, we we took out a few samples to try to see whether there was any sign of degradation at the at the tide line um, with the nitrogen capping, and it and it looked quite promising. So I'm just wondering if anybody is applying a you know a, a nitrogen cap regime to uh, superheater preservation in lieu of getting a, a proper dry out. Hello, Nita, it's John here. Um, just to, to reinforce your nitrogen, at times when we've had to drop our boiler, um, basically cold, and we know we've got moisture left in there, we've filled the HRSG with nitrogen on a number of occasions just to try and pre for preservation mm -hmm. purposes. Yep. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So, Anita, that's, so really the standard, that's really the standard process to avoid fitting in the superheater. If it was the reheater, it would be slightly different, but that's the typical, that's typical one for the for superheater. I'll, I'll, I'll just add a comment and I'm quite familiar with this plant as well. Just, it, it's a, it's a, it food, produces food grade steam. So any options people are thinking about, why aren't they dosing a film former or something like that are, are off the table um, because the, the food quality requirements of the steam prevent that. And it's, it's, had a lot of sulfate contamination in that superheater over the years um, due to the just the the way that the chemistry is operated on the plant, which is you know sulfate really supercharges those pitting kind of um, electrochemical reactions. Barry, we've got one one other hand here from uh, Yun Chai. Um, yeah, um, <clears throat> I just asked a question to David. Um, I guess probably my question was not quite clear. Um, for the electrode boiler, because it's um, the principle may be quite different to traditional um, chlorophyll or gas fired boiler. So my question is more about how this uh, steam production uh, can be controlled through electric. Electricity voltage, or it's through the water level, or through um, any other things like uh, control valve pressure, or so how it's, how it's controlled. Uh, the steam production rates controlled by your water level, and how much of the electrodes exposed. Um, so it's basically pressure um, control is the. Sorry, go on. Primarily um, pressure pressure control and the depth in which the electrodes are immersed into the into the level in the basket affects how much steam can be produced. Okay, so it's by both control valve for pressure and also the uh, water level by the, yes. the fit water pump. Uh, right. The pressure in the steam line. Yeah, thanks. These units, okay. these units are basically constant pressure. They don't, we even, we don't have much pressure variation on any of them, do we, Anita? No, no. Once, I mean, once uh, they're up, they, they have a variable steam steam load, but uh, basically the primary loop is is the pressure control. Okay. Good. Well, I don't see any others, Bob. So it's almost exactly on time. I think we'll just close out. Uh, we'll close out today, and uh, look forward to seeing everybody at the same time tomorrow. Good. Let's thank the sponsors again. Yeah, and, they're uh, right. They're right, they're right here on the screen. We've seen a few of yeah. them, and we'll see. We'll see a few more tomorrow. Okay. Well. Good night. Good morning. Good day. Good afternoon. Just a reminder when you're logging in tomorrow to log in with your full name, please. Thank you. Okay. That's good. Thanks, everybody. See you in the morning. Bye bye.
uh, Chris Willard and John O'Rourke uh, can stick around for a few minutes, that would be great. Okay, that's good. Oh, Rachel's still here. You've been you've been taking notes, have you? Yes, learning a lot. You could let me loose now in a power station, and it would be fine. Uh, we we might let you to the gate. <laughs> Hi, hey, hey, Chris, how you doing? Guys, how are you? All good. No, no sound, no sound. Yeah. Oh, it's still, uh, it's still really low, Chris. Yeah, I think it's getting better. Yeah, getting better. There it is. <laughs> okay. Oh. Sorry, guys. Yeah, I think it's just I just had to change a couple of settings. How are you? Is all good? Everybody's you look well. Good. Just like in real life. Yeah, mate. Yeah. But next year, next year we get you over. Hey. Yeah. Yeah, we we definitely uh, we'll we'll definitely try. We have it. We have everything all booked. So um, all we have to do all we have to do is come. But, yeah. but you know, there's a you know there's a lot of discussion now. Uh, but Bob and I run quite a few of these. You know, like we have over a hundred people, hundred and ten people here. We never ever had hundred and ten live, and that that would go through your booth. And, you know, so what do you miss? You miss a coffee in the morning and a tea in the morning and in the afternoon and a beer with you in the evening, you know, yeah. but, uh, but, but from our point of view, we don't transfer the technology to as many people. No, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So, well, if we could only charge a hundred dollars, we might, but unfortunately <laughs> we can't afford that. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. So, uh, as oh. Gary Boy found out on the very first one. Yeah. Yep. yep. Well, I think uh, Scott, did you want to do something with with Chris or? I just want to test Chris's uh, okay. audio, which we we fixed that, and then he's gonna yep. share his uh, he's gonna he's gonna share his screen here for the first time. Okay. And oh, okay. We'll see how that works out. So well, I made you the pres. I made you the presenter, Chris, so you you can Good. load up so that I'm PowerPoint. Going to, I'm I'm going to sign out because it's one o'clock here. Okay. And, uh, I'll see you tomorrow. I'm Not a problem. Here, but I haven't had dinner, so I think I'll leave too. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> see ya. Thank you. Bye. See you guys. Thanks, guys. Bye. So you should see full screen. Should. <laughs> 